Uh, howdy, Oaks, and welcome back to Bacon and Eggs. Uh, we're talking this week about Back to the Future Part 3. As always, I am Tyler Carlin. I'm Ethan Edgehill. And, and this week we have a very, very special guest uh, cutting out, cutting in. Uh, this is my cousin, Nate Pratt. He has been an animator with Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, uh, Disney. Uh, he's done just about everything there is to do, and he's a Back to the Future super fan, and we're very, very excited to have him on the show. Nate, do you want to introduce yourself and maybe give a little spiel about who you are? Sure, sure. Yeah, I am Nate, like these guys said, and uh, yeah, I'm a big Back to the Future fan. I just love uh, entertainment in general. That was one of the big things with, you know, growing up and uh, just having this... Uh, you know, love for doing art and things like that. And, you know, it was funny enough, um, it was the movie in between Back to the Future and Back to the Future 2 that really set me off in this career, and that would be Who Framed Roger Rabbit, another mm. uh, Robert Zemeckis film and Steven Spielberg and all those guys. Uh, and that when I saw that movie, like, I was just like, I'm that's my career. I'm going to do that. I want to do something that is as cool as that. It just blew my mind and to this uh, day. I mean, you couldn't have picked amazing. a more groundbreaking movie to exactly. right, kind of get in on. Exactly you know, one that. Of the, the first serious attempts at, at making animated characters kind of exist in real life. It blew my mind. I loved it. And it was it just, was, yeah. after that, I'm like, Golden, I'm doing this. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you just yeah. chasing a dream right there. Yeah, and it worked out. I went to um, Savannah College of Art and Design down in Savannah, Georgia. Okay, there you go. And, yeah, um, did uh, 2D animation there. Uh, and that was the old like pencil and paper like animation, hand-drawn. And while I was there, it was kind of funny. I got into uh, flash animation. And I just took a uh, you know an extracurricular class there. Um, and who knew that that would actually like help me out so much with my career. Right. Um, going forward, after I graduated, I went over to uh, Turner Broadcasting and I started working um, for Cartoon Network and Adult Swim and I worked on a couple shows you guys might know, uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Okay. Uh, Harvey Birdman. You, Go ahead. Yeah. You did like that scene with Eduardo and, and all that stuff and that was on your reel anyway. That's yeah, what I yeah. I've animated those I characters. I loved that show, Foster's Home. Yeah, it was a fun one. So I did some like bumpers and uh, commercials, uh, some... Just like little uh, promotional things, some of the DVD animation, things like that too. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other shows were uh, Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, and that's on Adult Swim uh, now and again. And then a short-lived show called uh, Stroker and Hoop that lasted one season. Um, and then, yeah, just a whole handful of like other uh, shows. I actually uh, worked on um, for PBS Kids and did Word Girl for a little while. Okay. And uh, yeah, and so like animation kind of just like brings you all over the place. And then finally came down here to Florida and uh, and went to work for the Mouse House and do um, you know marketing campaigns for the parks, the resorts, and the cruise lines and things like that. Okay. So it's kind of fun. And then on the side, just do freelance. So if anybody out there is looking for some animation, give me a shout. You can find me at natepratt.com. That's all one word and N-A-T-E-P-R-A-T-T dot -T -T com. And uh, also have a partner company called Pixadactyl, and that's P I X A D A C T Y L dot com. There you go. You yeah. Got, so you're you're still at Disney. Still with Disney, yeah, off and on. Okay. So it's like yeah, I gotcha. do contract work, and so I can like do contract, and I can do some freelance. And uh, our Pixadactyl company actually just finished up doing a music video for a company in Nashville, um, and it's pretty funny. The song was kind of like this haunted spooky song and they wanted it in a scooby-doo kind of look so there you go it's oh, uh, very cool yeah, yeah so it's like four minutes of uh like a little scooby-doo like <laughs> short kind of thing so That's very inspired so cool. anyway Fun. yeah not scooby-doo himself but just you know very inspired so same kind of style yeah exactly yeah very Hanna Barbera looking fair enough so yeah. how did you get into back to the future okay so that was just as you know this is funny this goes back to uh christmas morning I just, I love that movie um, as far back as I can remember. I never got to see Back to the Future 1 in theaters, um, but I remember my parents taking me to uh, part 2 and 3, and I just remember one Christmas, uh, my dad had gotten me the box set trilogy of Back to the Future and VHS, so this is, this is a big deal. This is no internet, this isn't DVD, there's no behind right. the scenes you right. can't watch the making of or anything and i swear i wore those tapes down like you wouldn't believe uh, just watching those movies over and over again and they came with a um an extra vhs tape of uh the secrets of the back to the future trilogy and so it was like oh my god nobody's ever seen this it was only a half hour long and it was so cool because it was like our first glimpse into any of the movie making 
Uh, so wait, it came with like a behind the scenes tape. Yes, it did. So it was that's a, a I've four never tape heard that in my box life. set. Yeah, I, to this day, I still have the box set. It's like it's the holy grail. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, yeah, that's the 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 hook right there. Right, right. And so, uh, so just from there, I mean, I would just watch these movies, and I love them, and they're they're timeless because I think they're like they're just a good buddy buddy film. Like they're just uh, good friends that's trying to go on this crazy adventure. And uh, and it's just enjoyable. The, the the script is perfect. The comedic timing, the action, the adventure. Like I don't know how to categorize this movie because it's like, you know, is it a comedy? Is it a sci-fi? Like what are we working with? It's but but it's everything in that sense, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's so enjoyable that way. And so you know, after just like having these uh, VHS tapes and DVD came along and all this other stuff, and it wasn't until uh, later on down the road that. Um, I got to go to a screening of Back to the Future in theaters uh, down here in Celebration, Florida, actually, at their annual car show, uh, Celebration Exotic Car Show. And they brought in uh, Mr. Stephen Clark, and I'll give him a, a nod, and that's uh, Stephen Clark. He runs the backtothefuture.com website, so all one word. <laughs> if you guys all want to check <laughs> it out, is. he is the premier go-to guy for anything Back to the Future. And he is quite responsible for Back to the Future being uh, what it is today and still going uh, because of his uh, courageous efforts for sure. And so uh, when I got to go to the screening, we were seeing the very first uh, HD screenshot of uh, Back to the Future. Um, what was going to be released on Blu-ray, you know, a couple months down the road, we finally got to see a little early. And so Stephen Clark was there and he brought some good friends along. He brought Christopher Lloyd with him. He brought Claudia Wells, and that's Marty's girlfriend. Christopher Lloyd, obviously, is Doc. Uh, Jeffrey Wiseman, who played uh, George McFly in parts two and three. And then Mr. Bob Gale himself came along. And Bob Gale is responsible for uh, coming up with you know, back to the future along with Robert Zemeckis. So right. I got to meet all these guys. It was cool. I was like, oh my God. It's one of those that things. That is like, so cool. Yeah. It's like one of those things like, you know, do you want to meet your heroes? And and it worked out that these guys were just all awesome people. So like, they were all like super great people and you weren't, you didn't feel let down by any of them. Yeah. No, I have not. And I mean, just really, really genuine, nice people. And I think part of that goes to like, you watch Back to the Future, and you can just tell everybody is having a good time making the movie. And it looks like fun. It yeah. does, yeah. And I think that's uh, you know that just helps you in watching it too, because you're like, wow, this is awesome. This is why I'd want to get into this career. This is why I'd want to be a part of this. And uh, and so they were all really nice, genuine people. And uh, yeah, and Stephen Clark and I uh, just went from there. We. Um, became good friends and I did some animation. I did some illustration work for the website for him. And uh, I'll say back then, cause it's been updated since, <laughs> but uh, I did the animated intro for the uh, Back to the Future website. And uh, and yeah, it's it's crazy. Since then, it's just, it's developed into a bunch of friendships with uh, a lot of, of people involved with the movies or just fandom in general. And it's great. And I'm still friends with these people today. And, um, and another thing that I think well, we can get into it later. I I don't want to like jump ahead, but uh, but that's kind of how I got into you know Back to the Future. It was just it was a just my absolute favorite movie. I mean, Roger Rabbit should be like my number one favorite movie. It's number two, but yeah, the the whole Back to the Future <laughs> trilogy is like my number one, you know, of all time favorite movie. And uh, right, and it so just you goes couldn't separate them out. You couldn't like rank them one through three or oh, I totally could. Um, I mean, but they're all going to come in like a close second and third. It's I, I'm just going right. to go one, two, three because. It's like one is such a solid movie. It is so good. And then um, and then part two, like going to the future, watching the DeLorean fly. I mean, you're talking about one of the coolest iconic cars like ever built that didn't have a very good run, but made it just became an icon in these movies. And well, yeah, uh, and, and it's really it's it maintained its popularity because of these movies. It's like, absolutely. It's it's funny. And I can get into a whole thing like that, too. I mean, we'd be here for five hours, but <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, but in that sense, like, yeah, like just part two is probably my number two favorite because they're like they're time traveling. They're jumping all over the place. And I'm like, this is cool. And then and then no movie has ever gone back into the first movie, like in a sequel. They'll like see it from another point of view or another perspective. And I thought that was like just ingenious. And uh, and then the third one is just so great. Like, what a great way to kind of wrap it up is like, you know, we kind of told the uh, the Marty arc and how his family's doing, and it's like, yeah, let's let's see where Doc 
you know, what happens to him, like where he's going to end up and stuff like that. And I just think it was such a great way to kind of, uh, you know, wrap the movie and you told the stories you needed to tell. And I think that was, that's cool. And you don't get that these days. You get franchises, you get cinematic universes and all this stuff. And I'm right. sure. Right. There's not any, any clean trilogies anymore. Like they oh, left right, this right. one. It was a very satisfying ending. They left yes. this one neatly wrapped up. I mean, I guess they could bring back some stuff if they wanted to. They were sure. really dead set on making some more sequels, but it wasn't something that it was, it was, it was it was tied off neatly in a little bow and that was very satisfying for me it is and it's a period piece in a sense because um just in like watching movies and having this appreciation for film in general is like you have a 30-year arc it's kind of like even you know with star wars now and, and getting uh, force awakens and last jedi and stuff like that you're revisiting characters we haven't seen in 30 years and in a sense, Back to the Future is kind of like that because you start off in the 80s, you go back to the 50s, uh, and then from the 80s, you go to 2015 and stuff like that. And um, in a sense, it's like following, um, you know, those kind of, let's see, I'm getting off track here. <laughs> the period piece part of it uh, is is cool in the sense that like you're starting off in the 80s. The 80s is very like materialistic. It's just, um, it's kind of like Dawn of the Teenager, kind of going back to like the John Hughes films with... Uh, all that stuff, Ferris Bueller, and um, yeah, all those crazy movies that he did, and and then you stick a kid from the '80s back in the '50s. I mean, already like you were talking about your smartphone before is now just a phone, and I mean this is no internet, no nothing, and just to stick a kid from like the '50s to the '80s is such a dramatic jump um, within that 30-year timeline, and I think that's where it's like such a period piece in that sense that if you did Back to the Future today and you sent them back 30 years, it's like, oh, we might have internet. <laughs> we don't have smartphones, but right. like you have such a iconic age of uh, jumping from, you know, what happened 30 years prior, what happens uh, 30 years forward, and where are we going to go, where have we been kind of thing, like Doc always says. Golly. I'm sp- I'm spewing I'm spewing here. No, now. this is this is fantastic though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like. I don't even want to say anything. I'm just sitting I, here. Like, yeah, I know. Just, like, <laughs> listening. <laughs> Welcome I'm back listening to the talk like, show with Nate. Fascinating. <laughs> you guys will be the guest. Yeah. Oh my god. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> But no, I mean, it's, and that was the thing I guess I missed when I was growing and not growing up with this, obviously, because it was a little bit before my time. But when I saw these as a kid is, is like, it was something that was just kind of, it was on one of the film channels, I think right. back to back to back. And my dad was like, Hey, you should watch these. They're, they're pretty cool. And, and I was just kind of like, okay, whatever. And I watched them. And I was like, these are you no know, pretty decent movies. I just didn't, I didn't understand really what it meant to anybody. I didn't understand the cult following. Well, not cult necessarily, but the the following that's amassed in the past you know thirty years since it's been made. I had right. I had no idea that there's this this group of people that that love these movies like this because you see it with a lot of these series is uh, a lot of times, and it was just not something I was aware of. Well, and, and just from my perspective, from watching these movies for the first time, I it's very cool to see like everything through a lens of like this wasn't just like the way people were in the '80s, but this was what people in the '80s thought of the '50s and thought exactly. of the future. Yeah, and 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 it was interesting for me watching it because I know a lot about the '80s. Like we were talking about this in our first episode, is that like the '80s are like retro chic in 2018, right? Like the 80s are in and are cool. Like Ready Player One is about to come out and that's going to be full of 80s references. Oh, yeah, always looking forward to that this. one. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're covering it here. It's going to be huge. And like the 80s is like quote unquote in. I don't know anything about the 50s, period. Like that's just not something that was taught to me. Like when you studied decades in high school, when you graduated in 2011, like I did, you studied starting from the 60s and moving forward. And maybe you touch on like the, the swing period in the 20s or whatever. Right, right. But like, like the 30s through the 50s may as well just have not. Well, happened. you know, except for like the 40s, the Great Depression, and World War II, and all that. Right, right, right. Very much but, so. but you're not studying like teenage culture. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, because the teenage culture in, in the 40s was the war. Like, right, like go to the. There war, wasn't. Right? They didn't have fun. There was no fun in the 40s. You had stickball. Right. Right. Um, Look that yeah, up. I like, yeah. <laughs> You make a very valid point is that like we skip over the 50s a lot and it's a it's a great decade for for movies and not movies yeah, well, for movies for music for everything for cars all that stuff but it wasn't necessarily like a great decade for you know America we had a lot of problems going on there was you know the Red Scare there was the the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War and the Eastern Bloc and you know there was no civil rights and so I think it's a, a thing a lot of people like to gloss over in, in American history but there's so much cultural significance to it that, that I'd almost forgotten about it until I watched these movies. Right. It's it, it's funny you mentioned that because it's the 50s is very adult. Like every adult knew there was, you know, 
seriousness going on. It was more of that boom of the teenager in that in that you had even go back. Um, oh my god! Uh, wow, I'm totally dropping the name of it. <laughs> I can't even think of the name of the movie. That's all right. But um, but yeah, you just you had the boom of the of the teenagers happening there with like more like. Um, malt shops and things like that where you'd, you'd kind of right. hang out with your friends. There'd be places to go and dance. You had, uh, yeah, you'd go get food together. You just, you had more of like the birth of like the rebellious teenager in that kind of time where they're, you know, car racing and stuff like that. Why can't I think of that George Lucas movie with Harrison Ford? Oh, oh American Graffiti. Thank you. God, yes. Yeah, there it American is. So graffiti. like, yeah, stuff like that where it's kind of like you are finally seeing the surge of, you know, the, the teenager kind of having a name for themselves in the 50s, kind of getting up and running. I mean, you, you have different groups, too. So you have greasers and you have your nerds or you're just your jocks and stuff like that um, as it gets up and running. And then, you know, just kind of goes from there more so. But that was kind of like the first voice like around that era that it seems like the teenager kind of became a, oh, yeah, they're on this planet too <laughs> right right and then you had you know the 60s which was the the whole drug era and the free love era the 60s right. and 70s and then this movie was made in what is arguably i mean the decade of the teen comedy yes very much so you know these, these oh, movies yeah. were absolutely made at a time when it was it was popular to make movies about kids and about teenagers for all audience because a lot of movies made about kids these days are for kids yes well yep. no i think i think that we're seeing a resurgence in the teen we, film and, and like, in the last in the last like couple years but i mean for the last 15 years yeah. before that like obviously stranger things things like that love are that. very yep. that's very much a show about kids for adults right yes and then, and, I, and, and, and and there's i don't think there's a, a reason I think there's a reason it's set when it's set, and that's that's what right, I'm saying. Right in the right 80s, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're you're it, catering to a lot of audiences, and I think that's what's fun about it is like you can kind of go back, and it's it keeps it with like your family, like oh, son, let me tell you about the 80s, or you know whatever, <laughs> in that sense. But it's still interesting to the kids as well. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it it think that what oh i lost that train of thought completely that went somewhere ah sorry <laughs> well i'll just i'll use that as a segue since you're talking about trains ethan in we're, we're this week we're talking about back to the future part three ethan you are our train expert and there is a bunch of trains in this movie i knew you were uh, gonna ask what, me this <laughs> <laughs> what, what can you tell me about the trains in this movie so the train in this movie uh engine number 131 which they used in back to the future 3 was actually it was a a rogers Aut locomotive works it was a 460 and it was run by the sierra railroad it was sierra number three that's their, correct. Their third engine they had. And it is considered to be what? like the movie star train. It's been in 39 different movies and 36 different TV shows. I am blown away yeah. by this trivia you're giving this, me right this now. This train is like a bigger movie star than most movie stars. Like it's been in more movies than most movie stars will ever be in, in their lives. You, you're spot on with that. You're saving me talking now. So yep, you got was, that it was, absolutely it was correct. Actually, it was built in, in in 1891, so I was I had a little bit of an issue with that, is that they couldn't just find a locomotive built in the year it was supposed to be run, but it, they didn't really change the, the format a whole lot. Um, and it's actually still running to this day. Yep, to this day, you can still go and you can take a ride on it. Yep, thanks in large part, apparently, of what I read to Clint Eastwood, who really, I thought that was interesting that he, he led a big charge to have this train rebuilt in the early 2000s. That's awesome. Well, yeah, because he was the one that drove it off a cliff in 1885. Well, and it was, so it was actually in a lot of Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <Yeah. videos. laughs> Eastwood Ravine. <laughs> right. That's those on that topic real quick. I think those little things are my favorite parts of these movies. It's like when he comes back in the first movie and it's the Lone Pine Mall. Yes. Oh yeah. It's like, that little... is the kind of stuff that I will sit there for 45 minutes laughing at. <laughs> I don't know why, but that is the, the, to me that is just the epitome. It's that attention to detail. The epitome of comedy in my mind is that little, those little tiny details that you you blink and you miss them. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I that's just, fun I to rewatch. So you rewatch it and you catch them, and like there's always something new. It always feels like you go back, you can watch those movies and go, hey, wait, that wasn't there before. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. And I was like, I, I definitely felt like I had that experience watching through these, knowing there's this huge culture about it. And like, you can see like the big things, like the Lone Pine Mall thing, like the attention to detail. So you know, when you go back and watch again, you can look for things you didn't quite notice the first time. Like uh, Biff's hoverboard or Griff's hoverboard is like Mad Dog or was supposed to be yep. Mad Dog or whatever. Correct. Right? Yeah. But it, it wasn't. Um, just like those little things like that, all those little, the way they line everything up is so perfect. I can just like imagine the headache of putting it all together. And right. And we talked <laughs> like about I this get... in the last episode of, we talked about Back to the Future 2, how that movie just had to be an absolute nightmare to shoot. Right. Like I get jet lagged thinking about flying to California and they went back in time and forward in time, like the span of like what, 130 years. Exactly. 
Like, I just cannot imagine. And did you know that Back to the Future was not supposed to have a sequel? Like, when the car uh, backs up and then the wheels flip down and it takes off and flies right towards the camera and ends, like, that was supposed to be just a joke. Like, when Doc's like, Marty, something's got to be done about your kids. Like, it was just a cliffhanger ending, and that was all it was supposed to be. It was, you know, yeah, I guess uh, mid-80s, like, eh, sequels maybe, but then it really took off. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's that was another point I was going to bring in, is a lot of these 80s movies, rightfully so, never really got a sequel. It's like, if they had made another Ferris Bueller... Right, a little less yeah. 17 candles. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> 17 candles <laughs> they did uh, am, I, am i correct in thinking they made a, a sequel to pretty in pink though i have no idea wasn't there i will say i like like i think i swear just to god on the... there was a movie called prettier in pink i might be wrong about this but I, I, it's I, that mandela effect you you think it and it might have happened but it's being right. erased. just yeah uh, t- <laughs> right space no, time continues. that does not exist i am wrong about that it, it appears to be the name <laughs> Uh, of of several songs, but nothing, uh, no, no actual movies. I'm, I'm, I but, might have to go make that. I'm going to look up Molly Ringwald and see if she's still around. Oh, right. she is. She's still she's still yeah. kicking. <laughs> but what I love about the fact that like the end, the sort of cliffhanger joke at the end of the first one is they even bring that back at the end of the third one with the little cliffhanger where yeah. like yeah, the Doc's like Marty's like, "What's your next adventure?" And Doc's like, "Who knows?" You know, yeah. and he like flies off in the train. He's like, "Where are you going like, next? Back to the future?" Nope, already been there. And just, yeah, and he yeah. and he does the same thing, and the thing turns around and flies back at the yeah. camera. And <laughs> yeah. oh, I got chills. I got actual yeah. chills when that happened. So and- it's interesting. The DVDs don't have uh, to be continued on the end of them. My VHS tape does. So in the in the uh, in the first movie, when the car flies right at the screen, and then it cuts uh you know in like part two and three it says like to be concluded in the end well the vhs tape had uh to be continued and Mm. they made the decision bob gale said we're gonna leave that off because we only added the to be continued for that vhs run uh because they knew at that point that there of course going to be more sequels right Um, but i guess the original movie never had a to be continued at the end so he wanted to kind of leave it as is like untouched (laughs) right so yeah i'll i'll I did watch these on the DVDs, and I did not see that correct. I only saw the yep. end at the end. Yep, yep, and then to yeah, be concluded awesome. at the end of part two. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was not that did not exist on the DVD. Um, yep. But there was like a was what, on the VHS. Did they have the trailer for the second one? They did actually. Yeah. Okay. So, I wasn't sure yeah, if that was that part of the point, actual like theatrical release to it. Or the third one. I guess. It, it actually yeah, was sorry, the in the third one. in actually in seeing it in theaters way back when I was a kid. Um, they actually did have the trailer for part three and it was so rare that you would get a, um, a trailer to a movie while you're at the movies watching it. And what it was is because they really wanted to tell people like, look, we're going to actually wrap this movie up. They, they wanted to, um, really promote it. And, um, Back to the Future kind of did one of the things that now is like sort of more common in movies today is like filming movies back to back. So they filmed uh, parts two and three at the same time right. uh, all together. And so when they, uh, they're like, oh my God, okay, we're playing uh, this at Christmas, I think, uh, for part two. And it's, hey, mm-hmm. hey guys, coming soon to this next summer, even is part three. And it was just kind of keeping people on board that, hey, we are in fact going to wrap this up. And, and the funny thing is, I think this kind of goes along with promotional stuff, is that uh, the script for Back to the Future 1, like going back, here we are supposed to be talking about 3 and we're talking about 1. Um, but it's, I mean, it all happens over the course yeah. of like five Marty and Doc days. Right? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. It really it's, it's, is one big movie. And I had no is. idea of this. It is, yeah. And I think that's where like movies kind of get confused as far as like, do you call them a part two or are they a continuation? And and I think that's where like these movies work because just like you said, it's one big, one big movie uh, to tell one big story. Well, and I think um, calling them part two and part three as opposed to like Back to the Future two, right? Is it feels less like a sequel and more like a a continuation? Continuation, exactly that. Yeah, and especially like today, it's like nobody uses two and three anymore. It's it's just uh, you know it's Age of Ultron or Infinity Wars or whatever. You know, right, <laughs> there's, a, right. there's a tagline with with your titles now. Well, and yet it is a lot more common to film these back to back, and and you're seeing more movies broken up into you know Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part one right, and two. Right. Uh, Mockingjay Part 1 and 2, Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 1 and 2. But I think this had the most accelerated schedule for release I've ever seen from a movie. It did, yes. 
they had a Christmas blockbuster and a summer blockbuster six months apart from each other. Exactly right. that, yeah. Which is amazing. And then what I was going to say is going back to, I think it had to do with some of the promotional material because when Back to the Future 1 came out, you couldn't find a Hot Wheels DeLorean or anything. And the movie actually, you probably know the history of it now, but like it, it was kind of a failed attempt because they had um, Eric Stoltz as Marty originally. And then they ended up filming a majority of the first movie with Eric Stoltz and then fired him and brought in Michael J. Fox. And they still had that crunch time of like, oh God, we got to deliver. But the um, the delivery date for Back to the Future, I can look at my book. I have, I got to look at this. Hang on. This is important. <laughs> There's a book? <laughs> um, but anyway, like so there's a Back to the Future Almanac that came out um, back at, in 2015, and it's basically the official like memorabilia guide to Back to the Future. And uh, what? yeah, it's an incredible book. Um, I highly recommend it. I got to meet the authors of it, and it's, uh, it's crazy packed full of stuff. But like you'll see like in the beginning of the book, there's hardly any mention of like Back to the Future uh, stuff as it goes. And um, they had released a couple of pins um, only for like the movie. It was kind of like the only thing they said is like on this is such a date. I'm going back to the future, and and that was kind of it. And uh, and they changed the release date. Um, yeah, so it went from uh, like July 19th, uh, and then they bumped it up to July 3rd uh, for release. And um, and so like you just didn't have any promotional stuff because so many of the uh, companies just didn't think this movie was going to make it, that it had any any room for success with it. Um, they had shopped it around to all sorts of studios. And, and they didn't like the word future, right? They didn't like future. Disney didn't like that it was, you know, a, a kid and his mom hooking up. And then, you know, in the 80s, you wanted that raunchy comedy. And so a lot of the studios yeah, said, said it's it not raunchy, raunchy enough. enough. Exactly. Yep. And then, so, and then Disney's like, oh, that's too raunchy. Um, so finally it took the like success of, um, Romancing the Stone and a couple other things to sort of, you know, say, Hey, wow, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale kind of know what they're doing. So, um, so then, then Steven Spielberg, he always liked the movies and he backed them and, and thus it was a thing. But, uh, but yeah, for the longest time, like, um, yeah, part one just didn't have any like promotional stuff, no Happy Meal or anything. That's crazy. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until Back to the Future 2 that you started to get more, um, you know, help with like Pizza Hut. You know, you can kind of see like more sponsors sort of show up in part two with like 7 Eleven, um, Pepsi, and Pepsi Perfects. Yeah, all that stuff. And Pepsi Perfect. Yeah. Nike and yeah, Nike and all those guys. Yep. Oh, I still want those Nikes. I, I, I got a pair. Those Nike Ma- you have those Nike Maxes? I do, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> what? Yeah. I, I got a pair. I don't have the official pair. I got a knockoff, but they light up and everything. It's, it's oh, that's crazy. so cool. Do they self-lace? They do not. Oh, they, they're, okay. just, they're like a slipper. Yeah. <laughs> but, gotcha. That's so cool, like, though. Oh. That's pretty awesome. I got a couple of Pepsi Perfect bottles also and things, too. So oh, I got some props. That's so awesome. That's Real so quick awesome. on the first one and all the other studios saying it's not raunchy yeah. enough. I was misled. Like, when we first announced we were doing Back to the Future on this show, people were commenting and saying things like, oh, I'm really curious to hear your take on that, you know, sort of incestual romance between Marty and his mom. Right. They don't even, like, hook up. No. Like, she's into him. He's not even remotely interested. She kisses him and she's like, oh, this is wrong. I don't like this. Yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. The community is lying to, like, I was I was misled. I thought it was going to happen and he was going to, like, fall in love with this girl and she turns out to be his mom and Terminator, Sarah Connor. Exactly. No, you're, I, you're not wrong. And I think if the movie was made today, it would probably be just that. It would be... Oh, yeah. It right. would be a lot worse. It would. And, right. and why, why is this teenager hooking up with this old scientist guy? Like, what, yeah, what's they, going on nobody, here? Nobody asked that question. <laughs> nobody right. asked that question in 1985. They're just like, they're, yeah, he's like a, a protege or whatever. Exactly. Right. He's just his friend. Yeah. And you don't ask any questions because it's like, oh, that's not weird. And I mean, we, we covered <laughs> we covered that a lot in the first two episodes. It's like, they get away with a lot in these movies as far as like, you know, the way Biff acts toward Lorraine. It's right, right. Despicable. Oh and, my God. It's, you yeah, it's not, pretty you nasty. You not do that these days. No, if no. You made a movie like that that like, it's not necessarily glorifying it, but just kind of letting it slide almost. Right. It's like, ooh, man. Yeah, I, it is. It's, it's rough. Yeah, <laughs> it would be quite like a statement piece. Like it wouldn't be in a comedy. It would be like no, this would be a much heavier movie if you made it today. Exactly. It'd be like like that movie Hidden Figures about like you know black women at NASA when that wasn't cool. Right, right. You know, it was like 
Like it would have been, yeah. yeah. In order to get away with stuff like that, today. right? You would, yeah. You would if you'd seen, you know, if you'd made this movie today, it would even there would be no comedy aspect to it whatsoever. Absolutely. Oh man, it would. It would. But Rick and Morty's funny, and that's sort of based on. It, yeah, but I mean, Rick and Morty doesn't follow the the same story arcs as like you know about Goldie Wilson becoming mayor and like. Right, right. You know, Rick and Morty goes a completely other direction. Like, and I'll give that. You know, I I love the show, and I'll give it credit because it's like it really takes you way further out than what I ever thought like Rick and Morty would be. Right. Especially if you've ever seen the original like YouTube video, it's just terrible. It's like oh my god, they were they did a like they purposely did a terrible like animation just to get like just to get a rise out of like studios and people and everything and see if they could get attention, and it works. So that's kind of cool. It's like they took a risk of yeah. I mean, they've obviously succeeded there. Obviously yes, they did. Succeeded. <laughs> Very much I can so. talk. Yep. <laughs> so I got to ask you guys a question. For okay. Okay. watching these movies, um, what's your take on part three? Like after you've just had like the first solid movie, and then you're time traveling all over the place, and then you're just you're finally grounded in in the old west. You can't fly the car. The hoverboards are hardly used. Like, what did you guys think of that? Like, did that take you out of it? Did it did it feel okay that you were somewhere else that they didn't have all the cool technology and and stuff like that. I'm so curious. I, to... The way, oh, the way, oh, I'll go. Can I yeah, go, first? go first? So the way you're wording this question leads me to believe that, like, when you first saw Part Three, you were not thrilled about it. Actually, I and love Part Three. I I love I, westerns because I'd watch them with my dad all the time and and stuff like that. I, I love think. Part Three. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I thought Part Two was a little like it works and it makes sense and it's it's easy enough to gi- digest that you're like, okay, yeah, that all makes sense because they draw it on the whiteboard and everything right. and how time works and stuff. I much preferred part three to part two because just as far as the story goes, like part two and three are just retellings of part one in different time periods. Right, right. And the way, like the parts of the story they told in part three, I liked a lot better than the parts of the story they told in part two. Cool. Okay. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain. No, and I, I don't guess. think you you're wrong. It's it's part two is almost like a tether. It holds one and three together in, in that sense. And I I hear you there because it's like it. Like for me, I love the time travel. I love the car, like driving all over the place and flying and, and stuff like that. And for me, that was like really cool. But then you had another, you had a grounded movie at the beginning and at the end. And I, I think that's, that what's worked really well for it. Yeah. And I, I also like, I also like the representation of Biff in the third one, probably the best. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just felt like in in two he was extremely like campy, but in a way that he shouldn't have been. Like he was in three as well, but in like the old western, being this like just evil cowboy or whatever was I don't know. To me, it felt a little bit more normal, mm-hmm. and he didn't look like I guess the makeup to me felt a little bit more natural. And I, I liked the character in three a lot better than I did in two. I also like didn't like that two was all about him, and I he like was one of my most frustrating things about the whole series was like just this. There can be this absolutely terrible person to everybody who has like little motivation to be such a bad person other than that he's big and a bully right (laughs) and like so that's that that was part like that was the part of the story about two that i didn't like as much and that's why i liked three a lot better plus i felt like he was i don't know when you think of like a western i think you think of biff's character i can't remember what his name is in this movie Uh, buford Buford, Buford, yeah. Buford, Tannen. Buford, Buford Mad Tannen. Dog Tannen, yeah. Yeah, but you think of like the, you know, you get out here, Clint Eastwood, I'm going to shoot you and we're going to have standoff, blah, 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 you know, whatever it is. Right. And whereas when I think of like 2015, you just don't call people butthead and like shoot your wife's child. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, even like bad people don't do that. Right. You just Evil incarnate fire your wife's children. Yeah. Right. So that was that was sort of how I felt about the the three films and and yeah cool so, cool I don't know where I'm going to touch that. real quick on your point of like did did the absence of the technology the absence of flying cars kind of bother me and the answer is no yeah. I really think that it came there's a thing they talk about in music a lot where if you it's it's the process of taking something away on purpose it's like you you it, you in, in, uh, purposely limit yourself in order to create something else. It's like it, it happens in music and art, and like you give yourself restrictions just to see where it goes. And I think that's a lot of this movie. Like for me, the story stands without the DeLorean in all of these movies. It's like the yes. DeLorean is almost, and I don't want to call it a plot device, but it's kind of a plot device in that like the problems with the DeLorean are what creates a lot of the pacing for it and the fact that like it couldn't just happen immediately but for me it's like the time traveler time the time machine could be a blender like it's not it, it, whatever it is it's it they it could be a police box right it could be it could be anything or... it, to me it was it supposed to be a refrigerator yeah <laughs> yeah 
And was it? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, then they was, were like, "Oh, you know what? Kids are gonna lock themselves in refrigerators." So like, right. let's make it a car. <laughs> yeah, and and the car definitely made it cool. But like, mm-hmm. and, and and obviously, I get the point. The refrigerator when it made it cold as well. Yes. In a whole okay, another way. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> but for me, yeah, the, the absence of the of the flying cars and stuff in this movie it didn't really change anything because it created its own individual set of problems. Like they right. had to find new wheels for it. It didn't have gas. Like it was it was such an interesting thing that I never even thought was going to be a problem. Is like the, uh, oh he tore the gas line. Like now they can't get the car up to this you know yeah, speed it, they need to get it to, which is just a complete arbitrary restriction and i love that yeah like, there's no there's no reason they had to write it so that the car had to be accelerating up to 88 miles an hour for it to time travel there's no like they it's not necessarily even well explained in verse one and i don't think it should be it's just like no, that's it, the number it's a hard number deal with it yep you're you're given the details that you need to know and that's good enough well and the other thing is like yeah so like like what you so were saying ethan is like you know needing to get to 88 miles an hour in the gas line cl- cut like it drives the plot forward but the movie is about like doc falls in love with clara and Mar- he has to be be for Tannen. Like, right. All the movies have this other not subplot. The, the, the thing with Delorean is almost the subplot. It's like they have this other plot that's going on. Like they have to you know fix Biff. They have to you know Doc has to fall in love with Clara, and they have to fix Marty's parents. It's like there's always something else going on, so that it's not just like oh Marty has trouble with Delorean because that'd be a really boring movie. Right. right. Exactly. If it was just like two guys trying to steal a train, I mean it would still be a cool movie, but it would be a whole different concept. Exactly. It's right. it's them. Can can they stay alive for a week while they're there before? Right. Can they not get shot by the, the right. gunman who killed 12 men not including indians or chinamen right exactly <laughs> and who can't count to 10 <laughs> right right he doesn't do a shooting at, at, at 12 he likes to do it before breakfast before breakfast yeah. and that's and that was that was my one fear for this movie is that it was gonna take the old west gunfighter trope and just mess it up and they didn't they did it just <laughs> no, comedic enough and they did enough service to the original spirit of westerns um, especially like a lot of the Clint Eastwood movies, the old school, like the spaghetti Western type movies. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that was, I thought that it was really well done. This is actually, I, I like this one a lot better than I like two. Not to say I didn't like two. It's just, it, it, for me, it had its own set of challenges there. Sure. Sure. No, I, th- I think it's a pretty solid movie and some people are, you know, they're against it and some people love it. It's just weird. So that's what I wanted to know was like, well, so critically it did better. Yes. Yeah, then then two critically two was the was the worst in the series. People couldn't keep up with time travel in the second one. I, I heard that argument a lot. It, that- it is a it is a quite clunky mechanic in the second one in that like there's a lot of back and forth and what's happening in this timeline and I think it's a little bit more up to date these days is like we've had enough time travel movies we've been exposed to that kind of thing where you kind of have an idea of what like this doctor who has been big enough yeah that like you have an yeah, idea what this, around forever. This, yeah. this cyclical timeline thing looks like where Agreed. it's like you like go that. you go to the the start of one timeline and that creates a, a separate timeline and the other one stops when you leave and like we've got enough idea of how that happens these days that right um that things kind of make sense to the general public. But I think a lot of what's happened in the last couple of years is that people are kind of going against this, uh, against the second one because it's largely proved to not come true. You know, we, we are past 2015 now. Right. And it was fantasy driven. And to, uh, from what they had said before is like, there are so many movies that did like post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, kind of takes like Blade Runner and things like that. And, right. uh, and we hadn't seen a movie um yeah at least when back to the future 2 came out that made the future look bright like oh okay yeah this is cool they got flying cars and they they got all these cafes yeah exactly which yeah when it's largely not that much different like yes the technology has changed everything's a little bit brighter a little bit more ridiculous right but it's like they still have the clock tower everything's still in the same spot exactly hill valley hasn't (laughs) moved anything like that and that's just a fascinating like and this is it's cool because they did the jules verne the time machine or sorry that was hg wells the time mm-hmm. machine thing where the 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 time you know the time machine can't travel in fourth dimensional space, space. Right, it's like right. it, it only travels in time and they have to f- fixate around these axes of, of places that still exist exactly right. yep i've always i've always had an issue with that trope because like i don't want to get like i don't want to be nitpicky here but the earth is moving right so like this fixed point in space isn't actually a fixed point in space right like i feel like i'm being nitpicky and i don't want to be but like <laughs> it's too late <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like, technically, if you... If the Earth is rotating, right, then the DeLorean <laughs> stays in the same spot. 
you're just gonna die and explode. That's <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Not even the, necessarily the Earth's rotation, but if like if you start to get like really meta with it and talk about the expansion of the universe and how yeah, like, exactly. the Earth is getting farther away from the center of the universe, like right, then you have some big issues, and it's like you're gonna be swallowed by the sun. Is what's gonna happen? Right. But, I mean, theoretically, Earth's rotation in the last thirty years hasn't changed enough, or in the last even the last hundred years hasn't changed enough that it would be problematic. It's like you're still going to the same time on the same day in the same spot like theoretically yeah. the earth should still be exactly where it was supposed to be now you get a little bit roughly a little exactly bit of problem with dates and like daylight savings time and and you know when did we start leap years and all that stuff but you know right like theoretically they probably would have gone back to a, a, like a day or two before that's what right <laughs> but that's that's yeah that's getting a little bit that's too, the metaphysics of it all yeah much with it but i can i can understand the, the mechanic of like it ends up in the same spot it's like because it's the same day the same time everything like that it's like it's you know the plus earth you got your theoretically you, you got your time. audience too that is like can they even begin to keep up oh no and, and in, in the 80s absolutely not right. uh, absolutely yeah. not I, I mean not even weigh in that today i think some movies like i don't know i i love movies and i go to them and i sometimes be like i could kind of fit, i think i could write this better like where you're almost right. like giving too much information and trying to over explain something. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's just like, I oh, thought no, about this... that very recently and I saw the movie Passengers. I like that movie. Yeah. That was cool. Oh, really? Was, you liked that, that, that was... movie? I, I, I did actually. Liked it as well. I liked it. Yeah. I, uh, really? I think it was, yeah. Cousin Chris did a great job in that. Oh, man. I hated that movie. <laughs> Cousin Chris. Thank you. Yeah. I was waiting. Ah. That. <laughs> oh, I didn't even catch that. Oh, man. <laughs> I was like, cousin, who the heck is cousin? Oh, are you guys actually related? Are you related to Star Wars? No. We're... Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> like, no, do you have no. his phone number? Sure do. Yeah, we're, we're golfing after this. Actually, so. You can text him. <laughs> oh, man. Does he want to be on Bacon and Eggs? <laughs> right? <laughs> Listen, if you can get Chris Pratt on this podcast. Yeah, well, when you guys do uh, Jurassic World 2, I'll, I'll bring right. him in. All right. Sounds good. Right. All right. Um, cool. But no, oh, man, I hated Passengers. The whole time I was watching, I'm like, this could have been so much better. I could have done this better. Oh, man. I think the problem with that one was that the, the previews didn't give you what you expected. But uh, yeah. th- I think the worst like exposition movie recently was the newest fantastic four did you guys see that one yeah i saw that with you yeah Yeah. where like miles teller is like fighting dr doom and being like what he's doing here it's like he's giving a news report to the rest of them (laughs) you know start doing quotes to the audience and like just like yeah get the dry erase board out and (laughs) that movie had a lot of unforgivable things about it oh my gosh yeah Yeah. Um, big time let's let's get back on topic here so so sure when tyler first posed you coming on the show to me he said that you you had wanted specifically to do back to the future three yeah i was i was kind of coming in with like i kind of wanted you guys to experience it for yourself kind of talk about like your talk like i'm i'm the older generation so it's like oh let me tell you a story but like you know, kind of. Back in my day, we had to rewind back to the future ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I remember videotapes. <laughs> there you go. Good. I remember okay. Blockbuster. I, we're not. I remember we're them. not that young. We. we yeah, uh, I'm not young. that old. Not yeah, I remember. Age, but... I remember going to Blockbuster and, and renting videotapes and and having them exactly. not be rewound already. Oh, those were right. Be kind. Rewind. Yeah. Good message out there. <laughs> For so... yeah. There's a whole generation that doesn't even know what that means. So right, we're not exactly. quite there yet. No, not quite. So that's good, but. For me, I guess I wanted to have you guys sort of experience and talk about, like, get your take on, you know, parts one and two and stuff like that. And with three, I would, I kind of wanted to come in with three because it's kind of like, where does Back to the Future go from there? And I kind of wanted to give you, like, what what did I experience, um, like, watching these movies up until, you know, today? And that's kind of the take I wanted to give gotcha. after, after your take with, uh, you know, Back to the Future 3 in that sense. So, um... So what I was going to like chime in on was some of the stuff that like sort of came after Back to the Future 3, um, you know, and that's happened throughout like just pop culture in general throughout the years and just, you know, the the take on it, like what, how it's affected people um, and, you know, just the uh, a bringing of like social media and stuff like that and how it continues to stay relevant today and, and things like that. I, that's where I kind of wanted to chime in because uh, for me, like going to see, and this is kind of a big deal for me, like when I went to see Back to the Future 2 and they arrived October 21st, 2015. Now you guys can like come after me, but uh, my birthday is October 21st. So Oh, really? Yeah. So I always like as a wow. kid, I was like, wow, where am I going to be October 21st, 2015? Like, you know, is it going to have anything to do with Back to the Future at all? Uh, 
well, I still like the movies, you know, while I've moved on to like something else that I'm, you know, into. And of course, I have other interests. It hasn't been yeah. Back to the Future from the get go. That's it, though. Right? I know that's, that's all, you that's care all about? I got. Like, nothing else. I'm tapped out, guys. Right. You draw Mickey just for fun. Yeah. But like, yes. Back to the Future is really what it's about. <laughs> so, so where were you on October 21st, 2015? Funny enough, I was in Hill Valley, California. I was on the back lot of uh, Universal Studios Hollywood. And no I was way. Right there. I, yes, way. So I was, uh, I was. Um, got to go to a uh, it was fan based it was really cool a bunch of fans got together and they made this happen and it was called We're Going Back and it was the 30th anniversary of Back to the Future and so me along with a bunch of other fans probably about 5,000 people um, throughout the span of like a, a week a week's time we all got to go and do different Back to the Future things in California um, so the event was called We're Going Back and we did everything from uh, getting into the back lot at Universal and then just hanging out on the on the Hill Valley uh, Courtyard Square there um, and got to meet uh, a bunch of the actors and the uh, filmmakers, the crew, cast and crew. Um, we got to tour the different uh, houses where uh, Lorraine lived, where Marty's house was, where George lived, uh, Doc's mansion, all that stuff. Um, Biff's uh, grandmother's house. And let's see, we had, they actually recreated the Enchantment Under the Sea dance at the actual church where they filmed it. Wow. Uh, so like, if you ever wanted to wow. like feel like you were immersed in a movie, like without doing VR, without being Ready Player One, <laughs> Like this, right. this was it. Like it was just mind blowingly awesome. So, um, yeah. So, so they, the Hill they Valley Courtyard this... set is still there. Like it still exists. Still there. Yup, and they still use it for movies. And uh, they actually, when we were there, they were using it for the fifties for the um, Marvel Agent Carter, uh, Peggy Carter series that they did. Oh no way! Yeah. Yeah. So they had all the uh, old fifties cars parked out there, which was like really cool because I'm like, oh my god, like. The 1955 Hill Valley. This is awesome, and the uh, they had a different facade up on the um, on the front of the uh, uh, courtyard. Clock tower. Yeah, clock tower. Yeah, but what was funny is you could look right behind it because all it was was just some plywood, like you know, posted up against it, and then there's like the columns and there's everything else right behind it. So I mean, you know, the magic of movie making. It's just a facade. You just take right. it down in two minutes, and you know. But they still had the actual, uh, yeah. Um, courthouse is still there and, and everything the clock and, and it's amazing and it was just like surreal I was like oh my god like if I had been able to tell uh, my younger self like watching Back to the Future 2 is like where were you going to be in 2015 and it's just like to have that experience and be you're going to be in 1955 I'm going to be in 1955 <laughs> Hill Valley but I'm going to actually like be on the set and it's like this, right. this is like just that's too so surreal cool. so you just so, went for it that's awesome yeah yeah and uh had some friends that were doing it and uh and so we just we went together I met a whole bunch of other people and it was just incredible like just uh we rented out another town on the outskirts of um of LA and I'm oh my gosh I'm forgetting the name of the town uh, but they actually like rented out this small downtown district and they turned it into Hill Valley and uh, and so they they had the 80s uh, cafe they had like all these like signature places that you see in the movie um, they did a, a screening of some of the uh, documentaries that have come out on like Netflix and DVD and Blu-ray and stuff for Back to the Future lately and uh and it was just cool they had hoverboarding like we actually got to hoverboard they brought in industrial cranes just like they did in the movie and we got strapped into a harness and put our foot in a hoverboard and uh and just like glided along and these cranes took us up in the uh, air and like brought us around sort of hoverboarding so cool it was what? yeah yeah we had um they had a train and uh they actually had uh, like a train track. We popped the wheels off the DeLorean, put train wheels on, and people were getting rides up and down uh, on the train, um, on the train track, riding in a DeLorean, you know, holding onto the hoverboard or whatever you wanted to do. Right. And they actually brought out the uh, steam engine that destroys the DeLorean at the end of the movie. So if you're going down the tracks in the DeLorean, you come around the corner and there's the actual like steam engine that's supposed to like destroy the DeLorean at the end. So oh, they had that wild. part there. Oh my God. They like, they just won all out. And, um, and it was such so, a, an experience. Yeah. Who put this on? So this was just back to the future fans, like big, big fans that are like, you know what? Let's just make a collaborative effort. Let's make some phone calls. Let's see who we know and 
see if we can just make this happen and and put it on and it was fan based and they so put it was up all a, just crowdsourced it was crowdsourced yeah that's and, so cool i mean for for a price you could pay you could do uh one act or not one activity but you could do one day or you could do all five days of it uh whatever you wanted to do and and it was just surreal like our um our day of like we went all over the place uh to tour la and see like where they filmed the different like locations so we went to um the hill valley high school and at the end of uh and like we just saw all the houses and stuff like where they filmed so like some of them is like the back set of universal but others were actual locations in uh in and around la and it was crazy to see all these places because they still relatively look the same like remember in back to the future 2 where biff is uh he grabs the playground ball and the kids are like give us our ball back and he's like go get it and he tosses it up on that house right yeah you, you remember that scene so yeah the actual house the the people living there had a whole bunch of playground balls for us and we're throwing it up to see if we can get it up on top of their house so like they, they were super <laughs> so awesome they were so cool about it it's like what if we break a window they're like ah whatever <laughs> And uh, so and we got cool. to eat. Yeah, we got to eat at the um, the Mc, or not McDonald's. Whoops, Burger King. Um, that you know Doc went to, and you know where Marty's uh, you know getting pulled by the truck behind uh, you know right there at Burger King, right where Doc's uh, garage used to be in 1985. So we we ate there at that Burger King, um, and then the end of the night we did a. Uh, we had a party at the McFly residence. They invited us over and we had a huge, um, just like they, they brought in like food trucks. They had, uh, they were playing the movies on a big screen and we just had a street party and it was right at the McFly house. And there was like multiple, uh, DeLorean time machines parked there. They had Marty's truck parked there, like all sorts of stuff. It was crazy. And, Oh my God. And so like, it was like each night or every other night they would do a movie. So, um, when we went to, uh, Universal Studios Hollywood, we did the whole backlot thing, got to hang out in Hill Valley. And then at three o'clock at Universal's, uh, big, um, AMC theater there, uh, they played Back to the Future 2 for all of us. And they started at 3.05, I want to say. And the coolest thing is they timed it up. So when Doc says, we're descending towards Hill Valley, California at 4.29 PM on October 21st, 2015, you'd look at your watch or you'd look at your phone and it was 4.29. Oh, um, that's cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was just like, you know, stuff, little stuff that would like totally <coughs> give like the Back to the Future fan, like just absolute goosebumps to be like, dude, this, I'm in Hill Valley this week. This is awesome. That's so cool. And, uh, and so, yeah, they had something for us each day and it was, um, we got to see documentaries documentary screenings early before they were released uh they did a back to the future 101 class where um we went to the twin pines mall um puenta hills mall i think is what it's called uh and they had doc's uh van out there and the deloreans park there for like photo ops and they actually had the hill vet or i'm sorry they, they had the twin pines mall sign right where it is in the movie oh man um oh that's parked cool. there for photo ops and everything and uh and it was just crazy. And then so during the daytime, we got to hang out at the uh, movie theater and they did a Back to the Future 101 class and they brought in uh, the cast and crew to talk about their experience, whether it was like art direction, art design, you know, coming up with, you know, what the future is going to look like or whatever. Um, even talking about like filming the ride that used to exist at Universal and um, all sorts of things. And it was just incredible. Like, so each day there was something. There was the, the dance at the uh, church where they filmed it and they uh, had one of the guys get up and he sang Johnny Be Good and they even brought in uh, the guy who played Marvin Berry. And so he's no way. doing, yeah, he's saying Earth Angel. Like, oh my God. He had movie That's stars so there like hanging out with you. So like, hey, this is Leah Thompson, hey. And she still looks good. And uh, like, <laughs> um. Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox couldn't be there, but we sure got a lot of other cast and right. crew that, that were a part of it. And so on the final night, um, it was kind of funny. They did Back to the Future 2 on um, October 21st. And then when we rented the town um, and we were doing the hoverboarding and then getting rides in the DeLorean like on the uh, train tracks and stuff, they did Part 3 and they put the movie screen up right in front of an old locomotive. So it was really cool. Um, and they did a lot to recreate the town. It was just crazy. They brought in some of the part two movie cars so they had the police cars parked there they had all sorts of like just tie-ins i i was just floored at like how much like crowdsourcing could just make something like this happen like just an experience in itself like um and then 
let's see, on the final night uh, was at the Twin Pines Mall. And so they had the big screen going on. And right before they started the movie, we did a uh, a Skype call with Christopher Lloyd. So he sent us all into the future. Like, he's like, good luck. Yeah, so <laughs> that was really cool. So he got on Skype with, like, everybody and was... That's so uh, cool. And wished us all well for the future. And then we watched uh, Back to the Future 1 right there at the mall. And this was just the mind blower is when um, when they're in the mall parking lot scene and the Libyans show up, what comes down the hill but the Volkswagen bus. Oh, the no. Van oh, there. Yeah. So cool. yeah, with these guys and they're yelling. And so they recreated the, the movie right, right there. They had a couple of like uh, cosplayers and actors that got into it. And so they recreated like... You can either watch the movie or you can just turn your head a little bit and see the actual action happening in front oh, of you. Man. And they they did the chase scene all through the mall parking lot with like all these people just like watching it and cheering and stuff. And it was just so cool. Like it was it was to me the best way you could ever cap uh Back to the Future. Like for Right. If you ever wanted to send it off, be like, sorry guys, this is it. Like this was just like the best way you could ever go out. Like but I don't think Back to the Future is going anywhere. But it was just saying like to have this experience and uh and to be a part of it was just so mind blowingly fun and exciting. So Well, and I can't yeah. even think of another series that you could do things like that for at this point, like a more recent series. Because right. like a lot of the the really like hit movie series you've had lately are like places you'd never want to go to right like no or, right, nobody or wants like, to visit the land or they don't even exist the Hunger games like nobody yeah exactly right and like if you had aliens descend upon new york like yeah. in avengers that'd be bad news right like <laughs> yeah well, nothing good, good is coming from that yeah, even like even <laughs> in like they just made the new blade runner and like that's an absolutely miserable post-apocalyptic wasteland like nobody wants to go there it's not fun right. it's not cool like there's no good heartedness about it no twin pines mall yeah. And that's nope. the thing is like I, I what I why I admire about the series is it is just so it's it a lot of action is still a lot of stressful like I was sitting there at, you know when they're they're trying to get Clara onto the the DeLorean off yeah. the side of the train and I'm just I'm sitting there like white knuckle in my chair like are you serious right now come on but it's and it still, works it's it like definitely so works. lighthearted though that you can just you can smile and have fun about it and that's something I think is missing from a lot of movies post you know 2005 I agree I agree I think. It's gotten to be like you need to have just too much action. Like, and give your audience credit. I think we're all smart enough that we really want story. We really want character development. We really want to, you know, root for the people that you've introduced us to. And let us have that. It's you don't have to write action around everything. And I think that's like really kind of cool with Back to the Future. And um, the ending of the original movie, the first movie was supposed to be Marty's driving uh, the DeLorean into a nuclear facility, like testing uh, nuclear, you know, bombs and things like that. And that was what's going to, you know, send them back to the future. And they just didn't have the budget for that at all. And they said, oh, my God, just keep it in town. Like, come up with something else. And just like you're saying, like, white knuckle, like, holding on to your, your chair and watching the car, like, drive down the road and watch Doc try to swing from the clock down to plug in the the other uh, cable and you know hope that he hits it in time right. like it's so like it's stressful and it's so like rewarding and awesome and then and then you have this alan silvestri theme that he did and that's what our bob Semeca said was he's like you know the movie is tame it's and it's a small town it's any town usa he's like so make the theme big and oh my god that score is just incredible oh, he it's knocked it out like, of the park with all three of these it, movies just it, it's my absolute favorite absolutely yeah. phenomenal yeah i mean it's it's like I love Star Wars, I love Indiana Jones, all that stuff. But man, like the Back to the Future theme is just like holy cow! That just like that gets you amped. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, oh, I had a point. I was gonna a question. I was gonna ask. Oh dang it! It'll come back. Oh no, but what something you just said. I just and and I guess it was a whole different time. But I can't imagine you just you made a comment about I'm not having the budget for that. It's like are you telling me Steven Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis can't get it done? Because at this point they walk into a room together and and. You know, the studios are just like, yeah, whatever you want. <coughs> they, in, in a time, it was, it was kind of, uh, you know, teeter tottering, I guess, yeah, a little I know, bit. It that's was, what I'm it's crazy. It's, uh, yeah, you have this recognition now. Um, but like, but back then, because they ended up filming the first movie with another actor and got a majority of the movie made, and then said, you know what, this isn't working. We got to yeah, fire him and definitely hurt the budget. Like that, that eats into the budget. You're also going with, um, 
you know, time constraints now because you already said this movie's coming out in 1985 and it's got to be summer 1985 and you just lost like, you know, weeks to months on end of, of production and then having to squeeze it all in. Yeah, back when they made uh, movies a lot quicker. Yeah, and you didn't have, you know, computer generated CGI stuff to, you know, just build up in the computer. You had to make models or whatever just to, you know, to do that. So I think going simple. Sorry, it's not to scale. It's not to scale or painted. <laughs> But it's uh, right. it's one of those things. Like it's I'm still laughing at that line to this <laughs> to this moment. I'm still laughing. Like from the first movie, I'm still laughing yeah. at that line. That movie is full of good quotes too. Oh, they like, all are. You can just quote them all day long, and it's but it's just that it, I think it's like finding the simpler route. Like and it works so well for what it is. It's uh, it doesn't always have to be grand scale. It doesn't always have to be big. It, it can be something small but it can be just as rewarding if not more so well and that's what i think people love about these movies is they're so you can wrap your mind around them easily because they take place in the same spot like, there's nothing yeah. it's not like oh we're gonna go to boston for this movie it's like right, it takes place right. in hill valley california just in different time periods exactly and it's like, the same it's the know, same family same there. clock tower yeah same clock tower right. yeah <laughs> same uh, saloon uh you know, diner, whatever. Right, yeah. exactly. And every time, you know, the Biff character walks in, it's just like, McFly! Yeah, exactly. Yeah, history repeats oh, itself. You're not Seamus McFly! <laughs> yeah. You look like him, though. <laughs> oh, man. How many characters did, did Michael J. Fox play in these movies? Oh, my gosh. So he, let's see. I mean, he did his daughter and his son and his older self. Uh, and yeah, Seamus McFly. Yeah, so wow, he, yeah, like five, six characters there. Yeah. Oh my god, all yeah. of them. And I think that's one of my favorite things about this whole series is that like they didn't bring in new actors for every younger and older role. Right, right. Yeah, they just, just like, kind of. Oh yeah, they just everybody looks the same. Forever. It's the same, yeah. you, know, you know, same Biff Tannen every single time, whether it's Buford or you know Griff or young Strickland Biff, and, old Biff, yeah. middle Biff. <laughs> yep, yep, and they're always. uh and the McFlys are always uh, going out with uh, Leah Thompson. Like, she's always there. Right. <laughs> always. Yep. It's, it's pretty funny. Oh. It, they do a good job of it. It's, it's really fun and well done. So just to talk about Back to the Future 3 for a little bit, give me give me your favorite yes. parts of this movie. Okay. Um, let's see. I think finding out that Marty's trapped, like, in the cliffhanger from the second one, you're like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And, uh, and then finding out, like, you know, that Doc put, it like, the DeLorean, like, in a mine shaft and, like, it's hidden and and the uh, the other counterpart doc from 1955, he's got to you know fix it up for him, hope it works, and like send him back to save Doc. Like I love that it's like it's a rescue mission now. I'm ta- I'm bringing you home, and it's like yeah. And so you're like you're just on board for it. So when I think one of the like coolest parts, like just at the beginning, to kind of like just get you right into the movie again, is when they're at the old drive-through, uh, our drive-through drive-in movie, and he's like, "Are you ready?" And he's like, "Ready." And he just starts the car up, and you just hear it come alive again. Oh. Yeah. Um, like it's been sitting for so many years just under a tarp and a mine shaft and you just hear it start up and it just doesn't sound like a car. It sounds like a spaceship kind of thing. Like they'd put all those extra sound effects in it. It just sounds burly and beefy and, and Doc's like, are you ready? And he's revving the engine and it just sounds like it's just growling and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, let's do this. And it's like, shoots the gun just... to let him drive off. and Yeah, and, he, and then the he score pops up again. and he Drives just, for a he's... lot longer than it would take him to cruise through oh, that drive right, through right. that drive-in. Those, yeah, and those Indians won't even be there. Oh, I was, like... I was sitting there. I, I looked at my girlfriend. I'm like, they're still going to be there. And, and then, they're still going to be there. <laughs> and, then, and they were still there. And I was like, called it. And she just kind of looks at me like, oh, Jesus. Of course they're still oh, going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason they would be there in the first place if they weren't. Yeah, and right. Yeah, like <laughs> it's it's. What sort of storytelling would that be? <laughs> it's what kind of a just, future was, do you call that? That was such so. a cool moment that I was just like, yep, because it was just like him hitting the scarecrow in the first one. Exactly. Yep. Oh man. All that stuff, so and cool. it, it was just like so that like just totally got you into the movie again and then seeing hill valley here's a funny thing is that was not filmed on like the backstage uh, or backlot tour at all uh universal um part three was filmed uh outside i think down in arizona um so they just went out in the actual desert for that yeah they did gotcha. and they actually built up a, a frame uh there was an actual existing little uh town that was built up uh that they 
filmed Back to the Future 3 at. And I think the funny thing is, like, it all caught fire and burnt down. And don't quote me on that. I could be way wrong. Um, but that area doesn't exist anymore. So, like, that was just, like, filming out in the desert kind of for you know, making up this town for uh, part three for Hill Valley. Gotcha. And, um, and I think that was cool too. Like the big reveal is like when he follows the train tracks and comes into town and like, dude, the clock tower isn't even built yet, but there's, you know, all the framework for it. And um, it just has good pacing the whole way through. It's like, it's really enjoyable. Um, but I would definitely say those reveals, like to get you into the story of like, man, how are they going to get out of this one? And kind of going back to what you were saying before, Ethan, with uh you know, the lack of technology, like not having all the futuristic stuff or being able to, you know, just be like, oh, I've, you know, got my uh, toolkit over here. I'll just fix the DeLorean. Like having that struggle of like, how do we fix this? How do we rectify our, right. and they our had problem? To, they had to create a problem they couldn't fix. Right. In that time period is like there was no gasoline. Right, exactly. Right. Oh, and I think they do a good job of painting just how little technology there is. Like when he's got the huge thing, you know, that's like the little <laughs> the refrigerator thing. <laughs> yeah, and it like pumps out one block of yeah, ice. Right. It's, <laughs> it's like a yellowish kind of it's block. This gigantic it's like... thing. <laughs> well, and and then and then he obviously has to make a whole huge steam train time machine. Yep. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where I had more appreciation uh, as I got older to watch part three to like Clara kind of bugged me when I was a kid. Like, I'm like, oh, who cares? Like, I could definitely you know, time that. travel and stuff like that. You're a kid. You're like, oh, girls, whatever. Yeah. You know, and you're just like, let's right. have fun. And and then as an adult, like I really like grew to appreciate Clara's arc more so and her influence on uh, Doc Brown and stuff. So like when Doc comes back, like. It, with the uh, train, like, I'm like, why does it look so weird? This is bizarre because it's like, yeah, they mentioned Jules Verne and, you know, my younger self, I'm like, I don't know who Jules Verne is or, you know, maybe heard of him, but don't know the whole, like, aesthetic behind him. Right. And, and then I, yeah, right. I, I, the train popped out and I was like, oh, it's a, looks like a Jules Verne thing. Like, absolutely. Yeah, right. exactly. And that, then it's like, you know, as I got older, I'm like, oh, I have a great appreciation for that. The, right. Like, the, the nods to that. And yeah. you can tell that because both those characters had such a uh, profound love for Jules Verne that it's like, of course, this would be their, like, pet project together. They worked on this together. Right. They and, built this whole crazy glass steampunk train. Silly looking train thing, but it's... You know, it, it works. And I, I was like, that's so cool. Like, I just, I had a more of appreciation for it, like, as I got older and, you know, was doing more art history and things like that and just finding out, you know, uh, kind of going back to, like, what you're talking about with history. It always seems like kind of in high school, you're, you learn history, but I almost feel like as an adult, you appreciate it a little bit more so. Right. It's being, like, told to you in high school. Right. And as an adult, it's like, okay, well, what sort of value can we draw from that? Exactly. You know, it's, it's like, I want those classes again now. <laughs> Right, right. Because in high school, you are establishing the new history for what in 2050 they will be making right. about us. You know what I'm saying? Well, I guess, I don't know when you were in high school, Nate. I don't know how old oh, you are. Oh, back, so. back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. But <laughs> what did the early and mid-2000s look like for, for those kids? And, right. And you're establishing sort of that history and, you know, those clunky iPhones they had. Look at that. That's crazy. Oh, exactly. And what's funny, too, is like I, uh, I taught at uh, Full Sail University down here. I taught... Uh, fine art and uh, 2D animation uh, for a little while here in um, Winter Park, Florida. And uh, what was funny to me is like, you know, growing up, it's like, okay, you need reference for something. You go look in magazines, you look in books and encyclopedias and stuff. And the, the college gives these kids laptops like to use now. And, and it's so funny right. to me because it's like, oh my God, you have Google at your fingertips. And, right. and it's that tech. You have all of. Yeah. And it's just like, you have like everything you need to know right in front of you. And and it's funny that way, just like, where it's like, man, I had to look through books and all this other stuff. Right, it's like, like if you need to know what something looks like, you just go to Google and search that thing. And the, the right, first right. three results is going to be in there. Exactly, yep. Yeah. And it's just, it's funny that in that sense of like, you know, come technology, you know, there's still kind of a, you know, get off your butt. You got to go still find this. You still got to acquire this yourself. Like it's uh, sometimes with technology comes like laziness in that sense, I guess. But it's like. Uh, but it's so funny because it's like, yeah, now we have smartphones and which are phones, like you said, and, 
and it's like we just count on them like as our daily lifestyle now and it's it's amazing like that like um and it's not like an old man like rant on my soapbox or anything like that it's just it's cool to see how like technology you know how far you can go and like what's going to be the next big thing i mean it's like the internet and smartphones were huge but like what's going to be the next huge you know thing to come along right and even zemeckis talked about that when he was making the you know the second one or the first yeah the second one right and just said you know he didn't want to include future scenes because everybody gets it wrong <laughs> Even Stanley Kubrick gets it wrong. Right. Oh, yeah. And you can never predict what's going to happen. You can only use what's already occurred to kind of use that as reference. Because, like, then that would definitely be the thing they missed from 2015 is smartphones. Right, right. Uh, You know, and obviously there was no way to predict that coming. We talked about this during the last episode. It's like, you couldn't even predict it when the iPhone came out. It's like, it was a a luxury item. Everything. It was, yeah. And what's funny, there's some YouTube videos out there actually of like, what did Back to the Future 2 get right? And there's quite a bit of things that it's like, yeah, that does exist. Oh, yeah, no. And and we were saying that. It's like, nothing particularly, it doesn't particularly look that different. Yeah, people would love those Nikes. The self-lacing, big, tall Nikes. They would sell, they'd be sold out everywhere. Yeah. (laughs) Every, like if Nike he came out tomorrow with like a really tall self-lacing basketball shoe like it would oh it would fly off the shelves fly you know nike I mean, you know nike made them though correct no, for sure did you guys know that yeah for sure. yeah but i mean if, they if, did if, yeah if it was just a coincidental like production thing it would like, be awesome yeah, yeah tomorrow they were just like oh, hey we, we're we're rolling this out to the public finally and like even right there would be an article on snapchat about hey sneaker lovers this is the right, next dj Khaled would be sitting there in his apartment like good morning <laughs> bless up nike released a, a self-placing shoe today bless up yeah, exactly. Indeed. And it, it would have it would have nothing to do with Back to the Future. Like, yeah, there'd be those people that knew about it, but even the people, the kids that have never heard of it are just like, yeah, this would be, be awesome. This would be so cool. Right, right. Right. Um, so Lonzo Ball, if you're listening, this is what big you should brand take notes on. This is what you want. Self, <laughs> self-lacing shoes. <laughs> well, that's pretty awesome. They, uh, they did a um, Fox Foundation. If you're aware of that, um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research uh, mm-hmm. is a very big deal, and I actually volunteer for that quite a bit, uh, and I have over the past. And um, what they did is Nike actually built. Um, they did two rounds of the shoes. They did ones uh, that didn't power lace, and then they did another run later. But they did an eBay auction that lasted, oh my god, for several weeks, and the shoes went for a crazy amount of money um but it was cool because it was for all the proceeds were going directly to the fox foundation for yeah for parkinson's uh research there and i just thought that was like the coolest thing they they did a little uh video with um with doc uh with christopher lloyd and they filmed it at the mall and stuff they brought in like bill Hader and a couple other guys and they're uh and they're you know showing that it's like hey check it out we got the the, the Nike shoes like in production and you can get yeah. them at this auction and it was this huge campaign it was called back for the future and uh and yeah so like if you had like five grand just sitting in your wallet like you could go to pair those shoes and, and it was pretty cool they were a limited run and then they did it again in I think 2015 yeah, they, yeah. I, yeah I've got the uh the article from michaeljfox.org right here yeah um and I was pulling it up while you were talking so if you gave these specific numbers up I'm sorry I missed it but, no uh, I didn't get raised <laughs> It raised four point seven million dollars yes. over a ten day auction. What? Yeah, it was crazy. Um, no way. Yeah, and they made fifteen hundred pairs Good of the Nike Lord. Mag shoe. Yeah. Um, and then in uh, two thousand sixteen, in spring, they released the self lacing Nike Mag shoe, and all proceeds went to the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Yeah. So. Good God, that's a lot it's of pretty money. Pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. It was quite a campaign. They did a really big deal with it. They had parties in L.A. and New York for it. I saw a lot of the uh, behind the scenes stuff with it. Um, you know, and it was just, it was crazy, but it, it worked. We got people's attention. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. There's a pair on, on, uh, Poshmark right now for, uh, $7,500. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what Poshmark is. So it's like a, like a, like a secondhand clothing, like eBay type thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Where like people just post their own clothes and then it's like, like Etsy for clothes that people have already used. It, it's, it's rent a swag. It, it is pretty much rent a swag, except it's like yeah. buy a swag. It, buy a swag. There you go. <laughs> oh man, we're just gonna we keep loading up with these uh, Parks and Rec references. I'm so glad you pulled that out because we keep oh, comparing yeah. things to Parks and Rec. <laughs> <laughs> I love that show. It's because it's the greatest oh, sitcom of all time. It's really so, good. I like it. Nate, I got a question for you. Yes, this sir. This is something something I kind of almost can't live with with these movies. Okay. Why 
is this what is this thing that marty just gets super upset anytime somebody calls him a coward like where that was did i miss that in the first movie was that a thing in the first you, movie you did not okay. no you did not that was a story arc just written in to kind of move forward okay. with, with something giving him a chip on his shoulder like something that just kind of rubs him the wrong way i guess but because it just it doesn't some, seem like the same Marty from the first movie that would get upset about something. A stuff little like that. bit, yeah. It's a little bit. It was kind of like, you know, giving something. I think what it was was part of like writing themselves into a corner a little bit because they didn't really uh, expect to do the sequel. I mean, I guess they, they got it, but they were like, yeah, we'd never have, would have thrown Jennifer in the car with them if we had known um, what we were going to do. And, you know, instead of saying, like, hey, we got to go to the future, it's about your kids and all that stuff. Um, it was right, kind of like had they just left that. As, they they didn't have to write Jennifer out, right? Or even have to go to the future. I mean, they could have gone anywhere. It was just like wherever you want to go next, you're you're capable of doing. And I think what it was was just trying to come up with all right. Well, what's the storyline that we can kind of do? Um, they were supposed to go to the future in the original draft. They go to the future and they come back and they actually go to the '60s instead of the uh, the '50s again. Um, and but I think what it was was just they were writing the script and kind of going well how do we sort of fit this all together now and i think they just kind of wanted to give marty a little bit more of a of an arc there that just maybe so he's not perfect and i think that's kind of what like he was a good enough kid in the first one but i think they just sort of right. wanted to flaw him a little bit um well and, and the and the other thing is i think it does a good job of opening a door that they can then close at the end of the third one when yeah um flee from red hot chili <laughs> yeah. peppers is like hey do you want to race right uh what are you chicken and then oh, like and, and i'm you know, so glad they shows... paid off that whole thing about the accident instead of just being like oh well we're never gonna yeah do yeah that again. yeah plot holes <laughs> right <laughs> no <laughs> it's and i think that's true it's like marty kind of deals with with that like he finds a way to outsmart instead of like getting even he he outsmarts uh you know Buford and he outsmarts Flea and, and stuff like that. Needles <laughs> and uh, Needles, that's yeah. his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, who is uh, his boss in the in the fake future? Like, right, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so I I think that works. It it was funny that they kind of just like oh they shoehorn this. All of a sudden he's uh, got an issue with people that call him chicken, but it, it worked. I think. I mean, it, it was a little bit of a different Marty character in that sense, but uh, well, but, and but I, I think it kind of carried the story a little bit. I kind of get what you're it saying. Made him smarter because like the first one really isn't about Marty. Exactly. It's that's about. My it's about point I was gonna make. George yeah. and Lorraine, and the second yeah. one really isn't about Marty. It's about the Tannins, Biff and Biff and Biff and Griff and Biff. Right, right. <laughs> Biff so the, junior all so of the them, third yeah. one is really the only one that's actually like and it's still about doc and clara but it's it's the little, first one is really like about marty and like you learn where right. marty came from you learn his payoff to the accident you learn uh about martin and well I, yeah i feel like i feel like one through three are about marty but then you know you got the character arcs through the conflict of of the individual parts you know what i'm saying because you're you're developing marty's character throughout the whole thing right uh, you know he's got problems with all this stuff but his his movie is like like if you watch them one through three there are subplots that deal with you know george and lorraine and then biff and all of his problems and then doc and clara but really it's like marty is traveling through time and how does he deal with that and you know he's also like a teenager and he's got teenager problems like he's got a girlfriend and he got a truck and now you know when people call him chicken it's a big deal which also is like a little comedic relief in the second one which gets a little heavy-handed when his own stepfather tries to shoot him yeah you know it's like <laughs> like, like it can get a little dark at least bring it like, rein it in a little bit with some comic relief right you know have poe dameron on the phone with general hux pretending you to were hold right him. off I'm holding kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Holding for right. hooks. Holding for hooks. Holding for hooks. Right. Tall, skinny yeah. guy. Call him a, a chicken and let. <laughs> right. Call him a chicken and let that be something that bothers him. Right. Um, and I think that makes makes it a little bit more connected throughout. I think it helps mature Marty too, in a sense, like. When he gets stuck in 1955 in the first one, like, Doc's saying, like, okay, hey, you know, don't do anything irrational. And, I mean, Doc is always saying that no matter, like, what time period he goes to. Um, right. He gets the it's job awesome. done, but it's almost sloppy in the sense. Like, he's, you know, getting chased by Biff in the Courtyard Square, like, on his uh, makeshift uh, skateboard. And, you know, kind of right. causing a, you know, his his blunder gets his mom interested in him. And, and I think that's kind of it, that... Um, he kind of comes off as the cool rebellious kid and his mom's like, oh my God, you're so dreamy. And, uh, and in that I mean, sense, if you had to choose between George McFly, who was just in a tree with binoculars right. looking at you changing <laughs> and literally any other male ever. Ooh, it's a tough one. Who would you choose? I know. But it's, uh, I think that's what it is. I, 
I think I like that dynamic that you go from super nerdy George McFly, like to, you know, I think he and Marty like kind of learn some lessons in that first movie. Um, and that's good. They help each other out. And I, and I think that's where Marty kind of uh, matures like in two and three. So yeah, having that sort of, you know, problem with, oh, don't call me chicken um, kind of thing going on. And then him working through that is, uh, like you said, the first movie is about George and Lorraine's life. And then the third one's like Doc's life. Um, but Marty is, is kind of like, you know, you don't always have to jump at extremes. You don't have to go all out, like think your problems out a little bit more so. Um because he starts to sort of channel Doc's, uh, you know, inspirational quote there. It's like, you know, you can accomplish anything kind of thing like that. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. And, and I think he starts to hear his friend more so throughout the movie. Um, especially because you kind of go back and you see how, like, Doc and Marty sort of meet in the 50s. And then they have this great friendship throughout. And, and Doc's like, I can't wait to catch up with you in 30 years and all this other stuff. And, um and I think it just it helps Marty mature in that sense of like, okay, how am I going to deal with like day in and day out, you know, struggles? Is my uh, attitude going to get in the way? Is it going to get me in trouble? And it's certainly when he blunders it and has his mom interested in him, he's like, oh my God, what do I do now to fix this crap? So, right. so it's one of those things to still, yeah, put in that chicken arc is sort of weird, but I think it helps him mature, you know, so at the end of the movie, we see that he's not going to just stand up to uh, Buford and, and have a shootout. Right. He's uh, going to put the gun the, down and fight him with his hands. Yeah, exactly. And then he's not going to race uh, needles and he's not going to get in the car accident and stuff like that. So I, I think a little bit more of um, seeing that his dad doesn't go uber nerd and <laughs> just be this awkward guy. Um, <coughs> and then seeing how like Doc works through his problems, I think he sees more of that... Um, because of time travel like he it's it's something that he's the delorean is never a solution it's always a problem um and that's the thing and it's just yeah. what keeps our heroes going throughout that movie so it's like as much as we love the delorean it's like it's always the the issue like it, it always starts something so i think that helps him kind of come to terms with himself that he's like okay my parents are good doc's good and now i'm gonna you know marry jennifer at some point <laughs> and i got a cool truck <laughs> Right. And then I'll have a cool rock and roll career and all that good stuff. Exactly. He'll keep up music so, and everything like that. Everything's hunky-dory. Right, right. Right. The future hasn't been written yeah. yet. So make it a good one. Exactly. And one of the criticisms I've heard about Back to the Future 1 is that, you know, at the end of it, everything's good for the McFly family because they have money. Right. And, I mean, and, you know, the, the argument is that, like, well, money doesn't solve all problems. You're still going to have issues. Right. This shouldn't like the McFly family shouldn't be this happy, but I don't see that argument, and, I, and well, maybe McF very few people. The have McFly this, family, but, like, I feel like, have that that they're better off because the way George and Lorraine met and got together was so much better. Is it wasn't just like right? It because, wasn't like she because felt George is a confident. Yeah, human it wasn't being. like she fell in love with him because he was the first guy her dad hit with a car, and then she molested him at the dinner <laughs> right. table. Is it's like she is in love with George because George rescued her from her like would be rapist. Right. Which is, yeah. Well, and George is that much more confident because he's not just some peeping Tom who fell out of a tree. He beat up right. Biff Tannen and, and, you know, married the girl. Right, and they dreams. just have a much happier relationship together. They're much happier people in general because their lives were put on that different trajectory. So it's it's got relatively little to do with money. I think that the, the story is that the money came because of it, the happiness. It's also, it's also the 80s, and the 80s was very materialistic. Like, if you had something, that was sort of like you... you, you I don't know what would you want to call it like you peacock it's like you do this dance you right. you, you flaunt uh, it. yeah you flaunt it and and that was very much what the 80s was was you know what you had sort of defined you more so because you know here's Marty he's the youngest of uh of his brothers and sisters and uh and and why does he get the truck why doesn't uh his brother Dave get it or his sister uh and stuff right. like that and so it's like um that's the funny thing is like you know, just showing like, okay, yeah, we're successful. It was kind of the way it was in the 80s. And that was just sort of a thing. <laughs> so I think that right. kind of goes into that period piece sort of thing. It probably wouldn't be the case now. It'd be more of a lesson learned. And maybe Marty saves up for the truck, you know, if it was made today or something like that. Um, he, he gets it. Right. You see him like dropping a, a $20 bill in a piggy bank or something. Right. Exactly. Like good moral values, guys. <laughs> you know, kind of thing right. like that. So. But uh, no, uh, you can just get him the truck in this, this day and age. 
Right. So I think, yeah, the, the money issue and seeing like, okay, yeah, he's not being pushed around by Biff at work and um, only giving him light beer and uh, and all that stuff. Like to, right. you know, the end where it's like the house is classy. It's like, you know, why would they still live in that tiny little rinky dink house? Like unless it was like sentimental or something like that. But uh, well, that's entirely because Marty needs to be able to go back there and not jump right. into somebody else's window like he does. in the Exactly. <laughs> That is 100% exactly. does Marty reason. Does Marty erase Star Wars and Star Trek from the future when he goes back to 1955? Yeah, I know, being from Vulcan and all, I know. That's, yeah, he, that's like Darth being, Vader from know, Planet Vulcan. Is, <coughs> exactly. Right, like... <laughs> Like, how is George McFly writing this book? Or is, like, George Lucas being, like, sued? Right. Because... <laughs> yeah, I've even heard another story, like, if you want to talk about, like, something that's really, like, far-fetched theory was one of the... This is just ridiculous. I'm probably going to lose your viewers t- telling you this one, or, or your listeners, I should say. Um, was one of the ones was like, you know, Terminator. Like, you have, uh, you know, Sarah Connor, you know, gives birth to John Connor because of Kyle Reese going back and stuff like that. So there was talk yeah. that, like, okay, Back to the Future happened once where uh, Marty went back in time. Doc couldn't help him he's just like i'm sorry this isn't gonna work i can't fix this car like you're you're crazy he just he feels terrible about it like or he doesn't even feel terrible about it he's like sorry kid i can't even begin to like help you and just sends marty on his way so marty never goes back to uh 1985 and then it happens again and that doc grows up from 1955 to 85 makes the delorean and all that but knows that he has to now have this He's he feels awful letting this kid go who is actually telling the truth all these years ago. And so now he's on board to helping Marty out like when we watch the movie. Um, so where I'm going with this is that the original Marty that went back uh, ends up taking Huey Lewis's career and doing, uh, you know, Power of Love and all that stuff with with his band right. becomes super successful. And that's why in the movie we see Huey Lewis working at the the high school because Marty, uh, the other Marty went back and, and took his career and became the rock Stole star. From <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and did that. I mean, that's a total fan theory thing going on. And it's really confusing. There's a YouTube video about it. So I know I butchered it, but yeah. <laughs> but like, right. But how could Huey Lewis be a teacher if he's also Huey Lewis, right? Like that's the, if he is, maybe Huey crux. Lewis was like, well, somebody already stole my thunder. I guess I'll just become a high school teacher right. and then be bitter about when people play, you know, his songs and loud say, music. yeah, you're too darn loud. <laughs> But yeah, total, total oh, okay. nerd theory there. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I could. It's plausible. It's definitely plausible. Every yep. every time travel travel story has to have an origin point. Absolutely. So with you guys, I got another question for you. How do you feel? Um, you know, watching these movies, do you feel like they're timeless? Do you feel like they can keep going? Like, do you do you feel like they have an an end point, or is it like Star Wars or something where it's just gonna like forever continue to be like in, in that sort of situation? I. I, I don't know how long necessarily this nostalgia thing is going to keep up, but I, I sense that it's going to be a long time where yeah. this generation and, and even so we're bringing it onto our parents and our and the older generations. It's like we can't stop looking at the past and like what has right. already happened and, and looking at it with rose colored glasses. It's because like we did, a lot of us grew <laughs> up in this time period where computers and the internet and iPhones and everything were being and social media were being invented. And so we look at it like our whole lives for the first time were documented and and we've just witnessed this rapid growth of technology change that no other generation prior has kind of witnessed in that because everything's so interconnected now it's the first time we've been able very much so to talk to people across the planet instantly like the first time ever right like at at this very moment i'm having a conversation with two other people in two different cities and like like, we just as easily get somebody from australia and somebody from china in on this call no problem right Uh, and and you sound like you're in the next room yeah it would not be an issue uh, but yeah. you know, even even my parents had to deal with like long distance phone calls costing more money. And it's like, yes, you still have to deal with that. You can't just call England, yeah, can you? Pretty sure you can. I'm relatively oh. certain you can. I'm not positive about that. I I very rarely try to call England. I wouldn't even know how to do it. <laughs> I know that you. Yeah, but yeah I know it's plus forty four. I know that much. Uh, but um. you know, I think that this this 
love for Back to the Future and love for the Star Wars and the new Star Wars movies and the new Star Trek movies and everything being remade constantly and the fact that we're on our third Spider-Man in 15 years. Right. Like, it, it's it's this nostalgia thing, and I don't know how long it's going to last, but until it lasts, or until it stops, everything from 1900 on is fair game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and just, like, to answer your question, for me personally, I watched it, I enjoyed it, it is timeless like i i don't know if i i had the same appreciation i would have had for it if i watched it in 1985 or i guess in this case 1989 for the last one yeah uh but or 1990 yeah 1990 yep uh, but like I, I watched it, the jokes were not lost on me. Some of it was a little aged and dated, like the a hey, butthead. Sure, sure. We'll give you a knuckle sandwich, you know. But like, like Eden was saying, that nostalgia is like recognizing that there was a time when people said things like this is what made this movie what it is in the first place. You know, like they went back to the fifties, and you know he tried to order. What did he try the to tab order? And like a, the tab? I can't yeah, give you a tab, like a tab if you don't order right. anything. Right, and that's really dated. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly, uh, yeah. But just like, this movie was built on feeding nostalgia, <clears throat> and now there's a nostalgia for the 80s that I don't think is going anywhere anytime soon, because especially like the 80s and 90s are like the last two decades, like huge cultural points before the documented internet. Right, right. Um, and I think people like have an obsession with that. Like, what was life like just before I could see what I was tweeting about it, you know? Exactly. Yeah, you've, you've reached a, that, a crucial, uh, you know, end of something and beginning of something else like you were right in that you know part of the whatever you want to call it, the timeline where <laughs> one thing ends and another one vastly you know becomes like huge just overnight almost right i mean i think if you talk to like anthropologists or whatever they will talk about like you know 2005 or was that whatever was the end of whatever age they were calling it and the beginning of the technology age or the the digital age or whatever because whatever it's... it is there's there's like we are in like a transition from a different period of human history to a new period of human right, history. Right, right. We're no longer agricultural and indu- industrial. We are like the communication. Right, technology. because we talk about mm-hmm. it, about history as being like historic and prehistoric, and like prehistoric was any time before recorded history, and like recorded history has come to mean something so much different in the past ten years. Right, I can give you like what over a million people's thoughts on the Super Bowl were just by opening right. Twitter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed the game last night. Who won? Oh, okay. Never mind. Right, so you don't have to go <laughs> hey, to the Siri. newspaper. You don't have to, like, you know, yeah. go down to the, the corner stand, find the guy in the hat, and, and ask him for the newspaper <laughs> to see if the Yankees won back in 1912. Like, I can just, I can go tell you the result to every single Yankees game ever. Right. Right, and in almost any room in my house, I can just literally say out loud who won the Yankees game, and a computer will tell me the answer. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's it's cool. It's terrifying. It's it's all of the. It above. is. It's terrifying. <laughs> also, hopefully, the answer to that question is not the Yankees. <laughs> just so we're all clear. Yeah. Go go Red Sox. That's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all, the family from New York who loves the Red Sox. Right. <laughs> oh, I forget about that. Oh my goodness. Um. So I, I would have to chime in for myself, like you know, growing up in in the time when these movies came out, to like following all the way up to now. Um, I think some of the reasons why these movies still stick around is um, after the movies were done, you had a uh, the ride at um, the Back to the Future of the Ride at Universal Studios, and it was huge. It lasted uh, quite a few years and was finally closed in like 2006. Um, and then on top of that, you had a TV uh, cartoon series. Um, on PBS. On, nope, not on PBS. I think it was like ABC way back in the day, and then it was on Fox again, and, and a couple of other things. It only lasted two seasons, um, but that's actually where like people got to know like Bill Nye because they made it like educational. Also, and they'd have these like little things at the end with Doc Brown talking about how you can make a uh, you know a, a let's see a lemon battery, <laughs> and Bill Nye would right. actually like come in and do the uh, the science with it. So like you had an animated series that lasted two seasons. Um, but I think what kept it around too, like not just it being popular as far as media uh, goes, is that Michael J. Fox came down with Parkinson's. And um, a lot of the people that love these movies and you know have a DeLorean or a DeLorean time machine uh, use them at events um, all over the place, whether they're doing conferences, events, or you know just uh, conventions and making money. And then donating their proceeds to the Fox Foundation for, you know, the Parkinson's research. I think it was such a nice way to keep a uh, franchise sort of alive and going uh, to do good instead of it just being like, oh, we all love these movies, but hey, we can get a picture with the car or sit in the car or, you know, balance on a hoverboard or something. And 
and then that money is going towards a good cause uh, in that sense. So, I mean, it's, uh, I think that definitely has kept it going as well as I'll definitely plug uh, Stephen Clark again at backtothefuture.com. He uh, does all he can to keep uh, these movies going or just the, the love of Back to the Future in general. And and so I think for me, like that was really, uh, how long was this movie going to like last for me and my interest? And in that sense, like I always will consider it an absolute favorite movie, but to see it go forward and to be involved with the Fox Foundation myself and to uh, help raise money and awareness for it has been very rewarding like on my end just to uh be involved with a movie franchise that i love so much but then also be doing something that's so good for a lot of people and um up into this uh we're going back celebration that happened in 2015 where they got all these fans and they crowdsourced this incredible hill valley experience um and it just felt like such a great way to kind of like cap back to the future for me like not that it's going anywhere, but just really felt like, wow, what a great way to like sort of you just finished like a 300 page book or 12,000 page book, whatever you want to say, and just feel like, wow, that was really rewarding. That was a really fun, fun book. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I think that kind of helps with uh, with keeping the movies alive is seeing how people, you know, who grew up watching those movies grew up and they're like, hey, I can afford a DeLorean now because I'm an adult and I'm a nerd. So I'm going to put a whole bunch right. of surplus on the back of it. And uh, and drive it around, and it's going to make people happy, and I'm going to be happy because they're smiling and waving and taking pictures, and I'm smiling and waving back. And uh, funny enough, I was just up at a friend of mine's place last night in, uh, in in town here, and he builds DeLorean time machines. So in his shop, he had no way. Yeah, he has uh, a couple of DeLoreans parked in there right now, and he's a a guy from NASA, uh, comes from NASA as an, an engineer, and he he. <laughs> he fabricates these cars and they light up they they're they're roadworthy it's not illegal to drive them and and he makes them up for uh you know it's a business for him so, so it's it's cool so wait he builds these from like scratch and not just body kits old deloreans or no these are legit deloreans coming in and um okay and he has yeah he he has a team and they uh they put all the bells and whistles on it so and you how long out the door, how yeah. long do you foresee before all DeLoreans are DeLorean right? time machines. Like, <laughs> oh my God, you're getting into a whole nother podcast, but there's a <laughs> battle on that. There is, so this is the interesting thing. You have this car that failed pretty much. It was built from 1981 yeah. to 1983. Um, and, and it just, it lost it. It, uh, the car was put together. Uh, they had great hopes for it, but it was at the last minute, it was all rushed and it was just like put together with like spit and bailing twine and gum and all this other stuff just to like make it run. And, and it's the, the movies are a considerable like um, you know crutch for like why the car is even well known to this day, right. and oh, it's yeah. so interesting because there's DeLorean forums and there's the purist, and the people are like, "This is John DeLorean's car. He built it up. It lasted this long," and you just wouldn't have seen him if if not for these movies, I think. And and it's well, yeah, and it's not like John DeLorean was like a noble person. Like he was like he tried to save the company dealing drugs. You well, know? It, like, he didn't actually deal drugs it was he was set up to fail the guy came from uh from gm and he was responsible for like almost making the muscle car like the the old uh, pontiac gto my dad actually had two of them this is way back before i was born but like he was responsible for taking a big ass engine and putting it in a in a regular car and 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 putting that on the map so this guy was actually like really good intentions it just didn't all really work out in his favor at all um and that's just something i've like learned over the years of like reading up on you know john delorean i mean yeah it was definitely a case for drugs uh but whether or not he was like guilty it it was more of a setup a sting operation kind of thing uh as marty would say <laughs> so yeah. um so in that sense like the the car failed he he really took that risk of going out and making, you know, a sports car uh, on his own. And he was very responsible for having this uh, this background and car knowledge. Absolutely. And even putting a lot of cars on the map today. Um, but yeah, when this uh, franchise or the car franchise, I should say, the DeLorean Motor Company failed, um, it was, you know, Back to the Future, of course, that really kept it going. And now... DeLorean is still actually around. We actually have a dealership here in Florida. Uh, there's one in California. There's one in uh, Texas as well. 
and it's actually mm-hmm. they're in reproduction still. They're they still have all these parts left over from the original factory. So today you can drop about ninety grand and you can get a brand new hand built DeLorean, like not coming off a you know a factory you know um, setup. Like these are all hand built cars. Like but they have all the like old new stock still to like build you up a a brand new DeLorean. So you could get like a, a twenty eighteen DeLorean um, to this day. And I think it's pretty cool that it still exists. It's still a thing. Um, but you have the purest, and this is where we're getting back on track. Like you have the purest of saying, this is John DeLorean's car. How dare you? Why would you drill holes into it to just put a, a, a coffee grinder on the back, <laughs> you know, and things yeah. like that. And vents and, the Mr. and all these, right. All these lights and bells and whistles and stuff like that onto this, you know, iconic car. So like, oh my God, if you ever wanted a, uh, you know, a, a budding heads, you know, thing, you could just hop on these forums and, and listen to you know, like Back to the Future fans versus the DeLorean purist and who really kept what alive. And it's so funny. It goes back and forth like you wouldn't believe, but <laughs> it's pretty interesting. So question about the time machines. Yes. Are they, are they being built to spec for the, the first movie, the second movie, third movie? Like, do they have the... That's, the, that's up to the client. Okay. That's... Yep, that's up to budget. You know, how screen accurate can you go? Um, which is a, a total thing in itself, too. Look that up if you ever want to know more about the, the Back to the Future community as far as sc- screen accurate DeLoreans go. That, that's, a, that's a pretty crazy story. Um, and, uh, but it's funny. So you can get one that says, yeah, I want uh, the... I want the Fusion... Uh, Mr. Fusion on the back, or I want the Plutonium Chamber, um, or I want the Lightning... Uh, rod right. connection there uh so so you can get all <laughs> the that red wheels um, they, and... exactly yep you can uh you can even get ones that they have these hook on um wheels so it looks like they're folded up underneath and like just sort of like a you know for a convention or something it looks like it's hovering and it's kind of cool but uh it's funny from my time of just loving these movies to now i know so many people with so many dorian time machines it's so funny it's like and they're and they're good friends and stuff and it's just neat to be able to like talk about their adventures and what they've been doing with their car and where do they go and and it's it's fun people definitely enjoy these cars um but it is funny. When are you gonna buy one? You know, that's the funny thing. I wanted one, and I think after I've been around them for so long, because I've driven them too. Like I've driven regular DeLoreans, I've driven time machines and stuff, and I'm almost good with it. Like I'm, I'm like, you know what? Okay, I've, I've had this, and and I see all these people already doing what I would want to do with them, and it, I think it's kind of like, well, I can share that experience. I can, um, you know, go with you know, my friends and help raise uh, awareness and, and money for the Fox Foundation, or I can go help them out at a convention, whether it's like uh, just, you know, telling them about the car, giving them the specs and stuff, and just like seeing the people's uh, faces light up, like when they sit in the car for the first time, or they see, you know, they get to enter their birth date in the time circuits, and it pops up because it works the same way. Like you right. punch your, your birth date in the keypad, and it right. comes right up on the uh, the time circuits. And people flip out over that stuff. And it's I've I've had the opportunity. I've met Michael J. Fox. I've met Christopher Lloyd. I've uh, met Bob Gale. And like I've really, like, without having the car, I've still been able to partake in, like, all these fun events. And um, and I think it's I'm, – I'm kind of good in that sense. Like I think if I did have a DeLorean, I'd probably just have a stock DeLorean. I don't know that I would – totally uh time machine it out only because there's so many of them out there now which is kind of funny i i uh i think there's probably about 70 plus delorean time machines on the face of the planet now uh just knowing like so much of the community and and seeing how people you know just like i said they watch these movies as a kid they grew up they became an adult and they're like hey i can afford this stuff now right and you know went for it i have a job i have a job whoa (laughs) Oh, I can still be a, money. Yeah, I can be a kid again. This is great. So, so for me, it's like you know, it would be fun as hell to have a, a DeLorean time machine. But at the same time, I've, I've experienced that lifestyle of kind of having one without having one, and I right. and I kind of dig that. So, um, and the cool thing about that is like I've done it. I've done uh, multiple uh, events and stuff with different owners of these cars. So. So I can, you know, trade like, or not trade or anything like that, but like, you just like trade stories, swap stories, I guess. Like, um, like how does one person, you know, do this versus another and, and to kind of see what it means for them versus these guys over here, what it meant for them and, and things like that. And I just think that's kind of cool in itself to like, it's, it's still being involved, but I don't have to like, 
you know, pay for when the car breaks down because they do break down. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I believe I believe it. Yeah. I believe they weren't great cars. There, no, there was a they reason were not. They failed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, today you can get one with, like, the specs. Like, it's going to run like a new car today. But, like, yo, man, you go back for, you know, the original ones. It's like, well, we'll get you to a couple states maybe, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. So it's right. definitely not a daily driver. Yeah, you may want to just put this on the back of a truck to get it right, to wherever right. you're going. And some people I know, they drive them everywhere, though. And it's cool. They, uh, they just had a uh, crew from... Uh, Let's see. From Europe, come over, and they did this. Uh, they did this world drive, literally, where they were driving three DeLoreans, and they went all over the world. And then they would put them on a freighter and send them over to another country and drive them around there. And they were just trying to hit every single country. Like it was nuts. Yeah. So they're they're cool little cars. I mean, they're easy, you know, enough to like if you're not a mechanic, like they it's eighties technology, so it's not gonna be that difficult to Right. There's only so you know, much out. that you right. really worry about, you know. Right, exactly. So I think if you, you know, could maybe change the uh you know, the links on your bike chain or something like that, then you could probably fix the DeLorean. So <laughs> having having been the proud owner well, of a vehicle from the nineteen eighties for a while. Oh ah, yes. Uh it was there's it's not as simple as you might like sometimes. No, no, it's not. And especially those cars, they had the engine in the back yeah. and you know, all that crazy stuff too. So it's it's uh it's a neat design. They're actually they were well the the approach to it was great. It just at the end of the day, it just wasn't all put it together exactly how it should have. Yeah, yeah. But it's a pretty smart design. Like the chassis and everything is was really thought out. It was pretty cool. So, <laughs> well, I, I we're we're getting a little short on sure, time. Sure. I do want to ask just for one more story from yeah, you. by all means. Uh, I I feel like it's got to be the kicker. Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's a totally boring story. But <laughs> you you just mentioned that you had met Michael J. Fox. Yes. I I I want to hear about that story. He's the star. He's it's he's, he's it's cool. Like it, I was working a um a comic convention out in uh, san jose california and um and it was oh my god yeah it was the san jose comic-con hey <laughs> and it was uh <laughs> actually uh started up by uh, steve wozniak um who was one of the co-creators of apple and mm-hmm. i got to meet him too so that was pretty cool like it um but the funny thing is like Michael J. Fox just doesn't come out much um, just due to the Parkinson's, uh, you know, affecting his lifestyle. And he so happened to uh, be doing a couple conventions and it just so happened, like, hey, I'm here and I'm with some friends and, and all this stuff. So it was just uh, we would do photo ops uh, with the car at times. And, and that would be like Christopher Lloyd and Leah Thompson and stuff like that. And Michael doesn't totally get involved with with all that stuff, but he it's nice to see that he's like coming out for his fans like and that there's still people out there that really appreciate like his his whole body of work be it back to the future or any other movie he's done um there there is something about the guy that just he is good in anything he does he really brings a just such a likeness to any role that he does and mm. um so it was just it was kind of cool i mean it took me back to kind of like being like a little shy and like oh my god i'm meeting so and so so it's just like you know, it was brief and it was quick, but it was just, I, uh, like what I've done actually is like, I have drawn up caricatures of, um, of each movie star or people that I've come across in the Back to the Future universe thus far. And I have to do a couple more here, but I've gotten, um, the actors to sign my own artwork. So I'll give them one with like a quote that I like oh, in the wow. movie. So, um, you know, great Scott, or this is heavy or, you know, whatever, and uh so the one i wrote to michael j fox was michael you're just too darn loud and he got a big kick out of that and then so he signed uh his name on my artwork so i've got michael j fox i got christopher lloyd uh leah thompson uh i've got what else do i have here um tom wilson who played biff and Mm -hmm. let's see i know i have another one and claudia wells who played jennifer in the first movie so um so i'm doing pretty good i've i've done up like drawings of each one of these characters um you know, and had, and had the cast sign them, so I kind of had this like little collection going so far. Should have hit up Crispin Glover. I heard he's super happy that he was in that movie. Yeah, I know he's kind of a weird, <laughs> weird guy, but oh my goodness sakes, yeah. So he he's got some uh, he's got some issues there. Yeah. And, and same with Tom Wilson. Tom Wilson didn't really like the series uh, that much either after it was all said well, and done. Can you blame said, him? <laughs> said and done. Right, exactly. Said and done. I can't talk here. Uh, but. He's yeah. just a hateful character. He, but he's so good at it. Agreed. Like, I, and I will say, like, 
especially like going back to what you were saying, Back to the Future 3, like he plays a bad cowboy like nobody's business. I mean, this is a guy who's like running and he jumps on the back of a horse. He just comes flying up and somehow lands in his saddle. And I mean, this isn't like a couple takes on camera. This is all like one shot and he's hopping up on a horse he's riding he's uh lassoing marty like i mean that's him he's he's learning how to do all that stuff and just to like i will say like seeing his you know alter uh biff you know from the future just being this total jerk like despicable person i mean i'll give the guy credit that is some good acting going on there i mean he can be intimidating he can be funny um and and he's just like he's a nice dude you know he's just like yeah they just want me to be the uh the bully i'll be the bully so um but yeah it's it's interesting to see how people take to back to the future did they like it or don't they and for the most part i think everybody had just the most fun on working with such a memorable film franchise and film series yeah, I mean, you probably don't don't hate the time you did it. It didn't seem like it was a miserable thing to shoot. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. And it's too bad that some people can, you know, walk away from it being like, I don't know. It just, you know, money talks at the end of the day or whatever it is. But yeah, that's Hollywood. <laughs> right. It's not going to always be smiles. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I think unless you got any final thoughts, I think that'll just about do it. No, no. It's yeah, I, I don't know how much we uh, talked about Back to the Future Part I know, three. I we feel talked like about the franchise. That's totally you did. Know, you guys are going to have to do another one. That's okay. <laughs> we'll we'll put it out and see what the, the response is. And if people want us to keep talking about Back to the Future 3, we'll go in here and, and do our yeah, usual yeah. rundown yeah. things. But I, I think what we got but, is some great stuff. I'm, I'm, oh, cool. this this might be some of the most Absolutely. fun I've ever had doing this, just listening yeah. to all your stories. Oh, I appreciate and, you guys having me on. It's uh, been pleasure to talk with you and finally catch up tyler i haven't even talked to you and who knows how long and oh i know yeah. it's been a busy decade yeah i'd say so and i owe you a big congratulations too and i'm just like yeah everything's going so well yes everything is going great so far yeah. have you been uh, on your honeymoon yet or what <laughs> yeah we, we went to cancun oh, awesome. and, uh, good deal. Uh, it was a good time cool um and we're gonna be in florida this year uh, near where you are so i don't know maybe we can set something yeah, up yeah that'd but, be excellent uh this was so much fun it was so great to catch up and absolutely and I, I I don't care if people don't like this. I am very excited to put <laughs> uh, this out there. And, uh, Good deal. Yeah. yeah, this was this is an ex- incredible experience. And uh, Nate, what is if if people wanted to get in contact with you or hire you or just ask you more questions? Are you open to people doing I'm that? I'm absolutely open to that. Sure, come on over and say hi anytime. Um, yeah, great. Can, what, what's the best way to contact? Sure, you? definitely uh, like natepratt.com, all one word, N A T E P R A T T. Uh, or if you're looking to uh, hire us for some animation illustration work motion graphics uh editing whatever we do a ton of stuff here i've got a partner and she and i um we are pixadactyl uh creative and that's p-i-x-a-d-a-c-t-y-l <laughs> uh dot com and that's where you can find us if you would like to bring us on uh, and do an animation project illustration work whatever you want to do character designs logos graphic design, whatever you're looking for, we can uh, hook you up. So yeah, that's where to find us. There you go. Very, very cool. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much for giving your time to this podcast and and for coming and talking about Back to the Future. I can see it's somewhat of a passion for you. It is. It's just fun. And I think at the end of the day, that's what the movies did. And that's what I think anybody wants out of these movies is like you just have like a great buddy buddy film it's just uh good friends and they're on an adventure and i think we all want that we all want to be amongst good friends and go on a fun adventure together and you know to have a delorean time machine and be able to drive it around or not you know it's going to put a smile on your face or just having a, a movie that's quotable a great script and just something that looked like it was so much fun to make would oh yeah it's just enough and you and it just it just rains that at the end you watch those movies you're like that was so much fun that was great yeah so, absolutely and i and that that's what makes them timeless hey fair enough not much more you can ask for than that no i don't think so <laughs> ethan you want to go ahead and uh wrap us up with contact info and uh get us on the on the on uh the well i was i was say we could just go ahead and let nate go we got a couple things to wrap up here ourselves sounds good well guys right. it was a pleasure ethan nice to meet absolutely. you absolutely uh, um anytime you're we'll do it again you want. cool cool uh yeah and then nate just Export your audio, upload it as a .wav to a link Ethan will send you. Excellent. Will do. Perfect. All right, right, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. 
So, guys, thank you for listening. That was our, our interview with Nate Pratt uh, about Back to the Future Part 3. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Sorry if this episode ends up being a little bit longer. There was very little we yeah, wanted no, to cut Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to um, go ahead and say this one's probably going to be lengthy. Um, but that's okay, because that was such a fun conversation to have. Uh, yeah. God, man. I, I, I learned so much about Back to the Future, about everything related to it, about the DeLorean. About the community. The community. And- the fact that they created a, a big Back to the Future fest in the middle of California. Whew. And that Nate's birthday is the same as Chris's birthday. And the same birthday. as the day Marty McFly comes to town. Oh, yep. man. Who would have thunk it? I really feel like as a result of seeing these movies, I'm, I am now a part of a community uh, that I I didn't know I wanted to be a yeah, part absolutely. of. absolutely. I have a lot a um, lot more respect for these movies right now. I might go buy a Marty McFly pop. Oh, I was actually thinking about that today. I was looking at my Korg and my Baby Groot, and I was like, you know, it would be a nice addition to this. It would be a little uh, Doc Brown. I can see that. There, uh, there, there are Marty McFly fly pops uh the ones from back to the future one are about ten dollars and the ones from back to the future two with the uh with the hoverboard are about 75 dollars <laughs> yeah what i think they're uh, rare um th- i think yeah I, th- I mean there's definitely parts of the culture that i did not uh yeah i had no idea buy into as much um uh, like the hoverboard i'm just not that interested i just don't yeah. care uh but maybe that'll change over time i will say like at the end of two i kind of felt betrayed by the series and then at the end of three I felt like, okay, this all ties together yeah. really well, and it lifted the yeah, whole I, I thing liked back up. T- three made two a lot better. But hey, well, on that topic, yeah. let's let's go ahead and rank this. Where does this where does this fall? It's can you start yeah. from the bottom and go I up? Got and I'll you tell you if it's better. Hang on, I'm pulling everything up. Oh, okay. oh, 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 lord. Okay, and what happened to our description? I don't know. All right, I, I'll me. fix it. Um, from the bottom up, we've got The Incredible Hulk, better. Iron Man Two, Thor: better. The Dark World, Back to the better. Future Two, Thor, better. Iron Man better. Three, Ant Man, better. better. I would agree. Captain America the Winter Soldier. Mm. I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to say this. And and you can tell me if you agree with me or not. But let's throw it in between the first Avenger and the Winter Soldier, just to get some separation there. I think it's better. You think it's better than the first, first Avenger, Avenger too? Okay. I don't think okay. it's better. I don't. I don't think it's better than Winter Soldier. What? Though. I think. I mean, I think originally when we had this conversation, I was pulling. Oh yeah, for you, Winter you were Soldier. wrong. You were you were chosen to be wrong. <coughs> so if you want to put it above the first Avenger, it has to go above the Winter Soldier because the first Avenger is better than the Winter Soldier. It just is. What I think. I think we can put it in between. I them. mean, it's it's up to you. Is it better? Well, hang that's on, a hey, rift well, I don't keep want going, to make. Is it better than the Avengers? Okay. No. Then yeah. then we got we got to put it <laughs> I can say we got to put it sure. at at number 8. <laughs> number 8. It's I will say Back to the Future 1 still remains the best movie. I would movie. agree with that. Barely. Barely. Star Over... Wars. I, I really like Star, Star Wars. Wars. But okay. I did too. Um, I did so too. we'll put it in between, put it in number eight, in between the Captain Americas. A little uh, America sandwich yes. we got there. Uh, what What is funny about this is we've already recorded the episode for <laughs> Captain America the Winter Soldier. Or not, uh, um, uh, mean, uh, the... the Civil War. Yeah, but that outranks most. Yeah, it of you, does. But it? we've we've already put that in there, but it's not on here yet. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, that's confusing to me because I'm like, where's the third one? Because I know we've ranked it. Right. I don't know where we ranked it, but and ever since this is just a sidebar, but ever since we watched it, I have like completely dived dived right back into the like into MCU Marvel? fandom and like yeah yeah. I can, I, I'm, I'm probably be done all in. Doctor Strange tomorrow. Okay, I just need to. I mean, watch if it. you don't, then that's fine. But I'm either gonna watch it tomorrow okay. and record it tomorrow, or just watch it tomorrow. So um, okay. but that being said, so we'll put it at number eight right after the first Avenger. Uh, Tyler, what do you think for a breakfast food? You know, Ethan. There's not many breakfast foods that's names perfectly tie in with the movie. Uh, but here in Roanoke, we have a famous meal. You can get it at almost every restaurant, uh, but it only goes by this name at its home place. Uh, this is a cheesy Western. Cheesy Western from Texas Tavern. What's on a cheesy Western Texas Tavern? Yeah. Uh, Do you know this? Do you know this? It's a fried egg. So it's, it's a burger. Fried burger egg. Burger with cheese, cheese and fried egg, right? Pickles, pick, pickle relish, pickles. and onions. I thought pickle relish was just pickle and no, onion. No, they have the specific relish. Then they have like, like chopped onions. And pickles, yeah. Interesting. Uh, anyway, that's, I mean, it's great at 3 a.m. It's terrible all other times of day, although this movie isn't terrible the cheesy all Western times is delicious day. all times uh, of day. Sure. That relish yeah, is whatever. so good. As long as you pickle relish is so good. <laughs> it, it changes the whole thing. But that's, I mean, that's what it's got to be. But it's a cheesy Western. Because at the end of the day, this movie is a is a cheesy Western. Oh, yeah. Um, it was either going to be this or, like, breakfast spaghetti. Because it really is a spaghetti Western. What is I don't oh, know what that means. Okay. Well, we might have to have a brunch about that. Any Clint Eastwood movie ever, like older ones. Are they funny? What What does that mean? Uh, it's it has to do with them being made by Italians. 
Oh. Interesting. Anyway, yeah, I think that's where I'd put it. I think that's where okay. I'd rank everything. Uh, I like Biff in this movie a lot more than I like him in we the other two Biff. movies. And Nate, I don't know if you're ever going to listen to this, but I don't like Biff. I didn't think his acting was particularly I mean, that's excellent. Okay. But. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, that, all that being said, uh, we are out of time for this episode because it's already long. And it's going to be long. So yeah. we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, as always, we're Bacon and Eggs. I'm Ethan Edgehill, and I am on Instagram and Twitter at WowNow, the O's are zeros. That is Tyler Carlin. He is on Twitter and Instagram as at AmeriCarlin. Or you can squish us both together and and get uh, Bacon and Eggs 23 to tweet at us. And you can reach us uh, by email at baconandeggsmedia at gmail.com. Or the best place on, the best place to get us is our Facebook group. So I'm going to keep plugging the Facebook group. It's been so much fun to have this group of people. And it's it's steadily growing. It's always getting more people in it. And we're having a lot of fun over there. Talking about episodes and making plans for new episodes. And roasting each other about games we play. And talking about movie pass. Yes. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun so far. So we really hope that you, uh, if, you're, if you like this show and you want to be a part of the community, like I feel like I am with Back to the Future now. That's the, definitely the place to be is the uh, the Bacon and Eggs fan page on, on Facebook. But if you like the show and you want to support it but don't really care to speak with us or the rest of the people, uh, or even if you do, uh, you can always go to Patreon and uh, become a donor of the show. And there's some great perks over also, there Also, well. all of our episodes are on YouTube. Uh, hopefully by the time this comes out. All of our episodes should be on YouTube. I think I can get that done, but most of them are on YouTube right now. And so you can go over to the uh, to Bacon and Eggs Media YouTube.com. Uh, I don't really know how the, the links work because we I don't think we're worthy of. We're not really. Yeah, we're not really people, worthy of having our but... own <laughs> URL yet. <laughs> so, um, but everything's over there. We're gonna be uploading all the episodes there. So if you want to like watch a picture, uh, I know some people have YouTube Red and they like to listen to stuff that way. Um, we're also gonna be dropping some other stuff on there. We've got a, a you know couple gaming series we're gonna do as well as possibly some vlog type stuff going on really whatever you guys want us to do so hit the youtube channel like comment subscribe that's what they say right like comment subscribe i think that's a thing i don't, I don't know i like ever since we started podcasting youtube i've forgotten just been how like, to youtube i used to know a, i used to know a lot about youtube and now i know a lot now i just watch youtube's youtubers podcasts i just listen to their podcasts uh, yeah shout out to your biscuits. biscuits oh but yeah i think that's all we got so uh, until next week tyler arrivederci oh geez doc this is heavy <laughs>